everyone and welcome to the 53rd episode of the Yorkshire Gamer Re- Big War Games podcast. And today we are going to be speaking to Phil Andrews and Martin Game. And Phil is the sort of lead organiser of the War Games show called Salute in London. And Martin is the president of the uh, South London Warlords Club, who run the show, and um, we're going to be talking all about salute and war game shows, etc. But before that, of course, we're going to do all the usual things. We're going to get an introduction from uh, Martin and Phil, and then we're going to talk about big games, and we're going to have our features section, and then big deep dive into salute at the end of the show. A couple of weeks ago now, I took the Battle of Mentana game along to the uh, Vapnatak show in York, and um, a great deal of interest in, in the game. Unfortunately, we were on the second floor mezzanine in the corner, um, which for a 12 by 6 um, historic game wasn't the best place. Um, most of the members of the general public couldn't get round the table. They could only get to one end of the table, which is a real shame. Um, it would have been nice for people to be able to circulate around the table and have a look at all the modelling and the painting and stuff that I've done over the last couple of years. But there we go. I'm grateful that we uh, were able to attend the show. I, As I've said on the show before, I used to do a lot of display games, demo games at shows, and I've kind of dropped off over the years, and it was nice to be back uh, doing shows again, and the Mentana game will be round a lot of shows during the course of the year, and in coming years as well, because uh, the salute, uh, the game, the show that we're talking about today during this episode, I will be reinvigorating uh, Jutland, which we did in 2016 for the 100th uh, anniversary of the battle. And it's uh, a huge game. It's going to be 32 feet by 8, and it contains all 248 ships that occurred in the main fleet action of Jutland. And for all you um, rivet counters out yeah, there, yes, 250 ships were involved in Jutland, but two of them sunk in the initial battle cruiser action, so that's why there's 248. Just get that cleared now before somebody comes up to the table at Salute and goes, I think you'll find that you've only got 248 ships and not 250. So there we go. If you hear me scream uh, at the show, that will be uh, that occurrence just happening. So, um, we've had a little bit of a chat then, uh, so it's time to actually get into the the uh, main part of the show. And uh, as usual, I always say to people, enjoy the painting you're going to be doing, um, whatever hobby event that you're taking, or whether you're you know, commuting to work or you're out running, as I know a couple of people do with, with this, then um, relax and enjoy the show. Without further ado, here's the interview. Well, hello everyone and welcome once again to the Yorkshire Gamer podcast and uh, here we are in episode number 53 and today we're off on our bike down to that there London and uh, my guests today are involved in the organisation of the biggest war game show in the UK. Salute! It's that big we've had to get two people on to talk about it. Apparently it's even bigger than Fiasco in Leeds. I know it's hard to believe but that's what I've been told. So have you ever wondered what goes into the organisation of a large war game show in the UK? How does all that trade and games get set up in the hall and it's magically there when you arrive and walk through the door and pay your entrance fee? Well, trust me, I know. It's a lot of hard work because we've done it up here in Leeds as well for a long, long time. So with one of the major model railway shows closing its doors for good in recent weeks, there'll be lots of things to discuss about the future of our own shows and what can be done by organisers and wargamers like ourselves in general to keep these showcases for our hobby thriving. Beginning in the 1970s, Salute has been a regular highlight of the UK show scene and this year, just like Fiasco. Surprisingly enough, it's show number 51. So let's find out about the event and give a warm welcome to Phil Andrews and Martin Gain from South London Warlords. 
and salute. Hello, guys. Hi. Hi. Uh, how are you? How are you doing this evening? Yeah, very good. Uh, thanks very much for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to talk about salute. Uh, we're very excited about it, and it's great to be on your show. It, it is fantastic. Have either of you uh, chaps done a podcast before? No. No. <laughs> no. no excellent. We like to break people in on podcasts on this show. We, we yeah, well, uh, rather than have the same old guests round and round and round and round, we like to have uh, new people on. So, uh, so welcome to the show. And uh, the first thing that we do uh, to kind of break the ice a little bit is a thing that we call the four minute challenge, um, and that's for each of you to kind of describe how you got into the hobby and summarise up to where we are today. Um, now, in previous shows, I've been a bit lax with my timing. Um, and I've let people ramble on. And because there's two of you, I'm going to have to uh, make sure that I do cut in um, with the four minutes. So uh, is there a volunteer to go first? Yeah, I'll go first, Martin. Martin, okay. So I shall start the stopwatch now. Okay, so like most of people you've been interviewing on your show, I started with Airfix and was massively into the American Civil War and Napoleonic Wargaming and... Uh, that's what I really got into it. And then military modeling came along and I started look, following Charles Grant, Napoleonics and things like that. And unlike most people, I didn't really seriously get going until I was about 15 or 16. And what really attracted to me to it was uh, a very strange event in Aldershot called the Aldershot Tattoo. You've probably never heard of it. Oh. It was an army open day and the army opened it up to members of the public and you go along and everything was free. It was fantastic. And believe it or not, they had a war game sh a, sh a war games yeah. tent, and in that wow. war games tent at the time in the seventies were the good and the great. You name them, they were there. Peter Gilder, I met, Philo Stern, Neville Dickinson of Mini Figs, Dave Rota, they're all there. It was a great introduction to the hobby, and that really got me fired up and excited. And uh, that got me interested in war gaming, and I started going to lots of shops around London and visiting regularly, and then. In the mid-70s, I managed to get into Solution, of course, at the time. That was a fantastic event. And after that, really got me interested in the hobby. And I started buying metal figures. Uh, when I went to university, it didn't do an awful lot of wargaming. But when I left university, went to work in London and joined a group called the Friends of Grouchy. Didn't join the South London Warlords, the Friends of Grouchy. And some great chaps that founded by a chap called Greg Foster. Ben Wilkins was there. Loads of quite well-known wargamers. And I played there for about six or seven years. And then I ended up moving to Leicester and I was there for a couple of years, did a bit of war game with the Leicester club, great bunch of guys there. And then I came back to London and carried on with the Grouchies for a couple of years. And then I got, well, sort of kidnapped to join the South London Warlords <laughs> and um, never really looked back. One of my first big projects was getting into soft plastic and fighting very obscure battles in South America. And, uh, I went up to quite a few shows, took those plastic figures with me, and they're quite successful. We put on a game at Salute. So I know the show circuit quite well, and I've moved away from soft plastic and uh, South America now, but I'm into Napoleonics and uh, someone you've interviewed, Dave Brown, a um, yes. good mate of mine, and we played quite a few games together. And uh, some of the big games I played with him, which I'm sure we'll come and talk about later, really mm. got me firmly entrenched into Napoleonics and uh, the whole ambit of his rules that he's produced. He's managed to sucker me into every set virtually. So uh, that's really a, my, my history of it in a very brief terms. Excellent. Well, you, you're just coming in under three minutes there. So uh, we, we like that. We like a bit of brevity every now and again. <laughs> um, you mentioned the older shot tattoo. That sounds like a, like a, a really good night out on a few beers and waking up <laughs> with a, a picture of a giraffe on your bum or something. <laughs> No, it was an amazing event. All I remember was there was free food as well. And uh, wow. we weren't particularly wealthy. And it was about seven miles from where my family home was. And you go yeah. there and you literally stuff your face with ice cream and free canteen army food, which was pretty decent at the time. But it was an amazing event, really amazing event. And you, you mentioned kind of getting kidnapped to join the South London Warlords. I've got these, like, images of an episode of the Sweeney and you've been bundled into the back of a Mark I Transit by a load of guys with uh, stockings on their heads. Well, my, I did go to the South London Warlords about four or five years before that date, but I had such mm. a bad experience that I um, thought I'm never joining there again. But I got persuaded to uh, 
give it another go. And I'm glad I did because sort of 20 years ago, I've been there about that long a time now. I've, it's been a great adventure and a great, you know, great, met some great mates, made some great friends, had a wonderful time. Um, so it's, it's been definitely uh, one of the best decisions I made. Excellent. Well, I'm sure we'll cover stuff about the club and, and everything as, as we go along. Uh, so we'll move on now to yourself, Phil. And uh, I've got my timer ready again, so I shall press start and off you go. Uh, so I'm a Gloucestershire boy, and I started playing with the Airfix on the back, uh, bedroom floor like everybody else. Though I went straight to World War II stuff and became overly obsessed with the correct all bat at a very young age, which nobody knows we'll be surprised about. Um, you know, Bruce Quarry borrowed on permanent loan for the library, a bit of oh, yes. stone, all that stuff. But I also thought Bruce Quarry's a bit more hard nosed than Donald, a bit more, you know, gritty. So I like gritty. <laughs> and it sort of came and went a bit, you know, sports, women got in the way, all that kind of stuff as usual. And then when I moved to London and became a civil servant, I got in with the Westminster Warlords as then existed. And the joy of them was they had a permanent setup, set of rooms in the third floor basement of the nuclear bunker under a government building. Wow. So should, should the bomb have dropped, we could have kept playing games until the end of civilization, which we thought was a really important bonus to the whole gig. <laughs> and it had a bar. What more do you want? Okay, it had a bar. Wow. Anyway, unfortunately, it allowed you to set up games for weeks at end, which did play to my tendency to have massively complicated, huge World War II games to my own rule set, which they humoured me with um, in that way. But so no discipline at all on that front it was terrible for that um i sort of wandered around a bit for jobs and sort of it fell out of it came quite a bit board gamey stuff i got into board games do you remember strategy and tactics magazine it used to be a magazine yeah, yes. game yeah, yeah. i one day i bought a shed load of those that op opened my eyes to different forms of gaming and the level of the level of historical stuff behind that I thought, oh wow this is really interesting you know argued so i got those, those and then when I sort of settled down back in London, I wandered over to the to the warlords and sort of wandered through the door and got sucked in to this exercise a bit. Um, I've sort of on the way there, I used to play lots and lots of mega games, the gin warming mega games, you know, the whole day, the ones that used to be at Sandhurst. Oh, I um I once ran the entire air operation of Arnhem for a day. And I've never worked so hard in my life and not been paid for it ever. Okay. It was just unbelievable, but amazing atmosphere and he Great games, real things games. So I'm pretty relaxed on that stuff. I'm not kind of, um, for some reason, I've never got into Napoleonics. I'm a proper rivet counter. And for some yeah. reason, I've never really got into Napoleonics. I don't know why. All, all the American Civil War. But anyway, so that was the club. I love the club because people will try everything. There were people with gear. They got to, you know, they happily played games with all their stuff. It's great. My contribution is a lot of World War II, 10 mil, 1940s. I really like the French stuff that period. But equally, I, I run a regular session of multi-party Victoriana pulp steampunk nonsense, uh, which is a regular <laughs> bit of fun. Um, I'll happily put on a board game or two. Uh, Atlantic Chase, a couple of GMT games. I've got yeah. a few clips of those. So that's kind of I'm into. I'm just warming myself up into oh, 0200 hours, kind of 28 mil World War II sneaking around the dark stuff, Commando. I've got yeah. a Guns of Navarone plot in my head somewhere. Anyway, that kind of thing. Um, oh, well, yeah, of course, and you'll appreciate this. As I've discussed this, you know, may have noticed, but I'm commenting on your 1700 ships because yes. I am I am the man who plays in Des Darkin's shed with the oh. ship. That's me. Okay. Oh, so, right. So those rules set. And I'm so jealous of your ships. So how, I've got some very nice <laughs> German metal cast 1250s. But how yeah. dare you do what you've done? I, can feel, I feel completely inadequate now <laughs> thanks to your 1700 scale tribals. Okay. So I'm not going to talk to you anymore because I hate you. Well, there we go. You'll be, there's a long list. <laughs> well, thanks very much for that, Phil. That's uh, much appreciated. Well, thank you both for your uh, introductions there. I always like uh, people to you know know who we're talking to before we <laughs> before we go any further with stuff. Now, London obviously is is a is a huge area with a, a very large population. Are there lots of clubs within the sort of limits of the M25? Uh, well, I mean, for you, you have ourselves, we have our friends, you know, further around the South Circular uh, in, yeah. in South East London War Games Club yeah. in that space. When you get to central London, there's the kind of, you know, um, 
London War Games Guild, which is a bit more of a collective of people coming together in yeah. certain events and certain days. If you want to do board gaming in London, I mean, there's been quite a big trend of people taking over pubs in the city that were, would not have business and hiring out the right. rooms for free. Yeah. As long as you buy a drink and food and lots of board gaming going on of both of all types, not just war game board games. Mm. So you see a lot of that. And there are, you know, um, I, you know, I could probably name not a moment, you know, half a dozen, you know, club clubs in this space that are inside the N25, but not huge. Um, yeah. In that way, I, I think. Oh, yeah, I think there's probably maybe a dozen, but it, it's the difference is it's the logistics. When I was in Leicester, going to Derby or going to Sheffield was so easy. In London, going three and a half miles could take you an hour and a half. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, you find a club that's local to you that you like and you kind of stick with it because going to the other side of London um, is quite tr- can be quite tricky. So having said that, remember, I'm an hour's drive from the yeah. club. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, I mean, but I love the club so much. I go there because it's the kind of place I like. Yeah. Something that's becoming quite common um, up north um, <laughs> is, is kind of like um, gaming cafes or... Uh, there'll be like a shop and a cafe and gaming tables there. Is that something that's caught on in London at all? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of of prices and stuff like that with retail in in yeah. the capital. I, I've seen it on the south coast, and there's a few places there. But in London, you're right. Rents and rates make that incredibly yeah. just impossible. And this is one of the biggest challenges we face. There's just the costs of, you know, living in the capital. People coming from outside trying to trade in the capital is, is very, very difficult. I, I don't envy anyone. And I think also, there's one or two, I think, again, the, the board game into the market. Yeah. I mean, we can talk, can't we, about the fact that during COVID, board games went bananas in general. And that has spilled out, I think, into the war gaming world as we know it. I mean, if, if you don't mind, we're going to lose track a bit. I mean, there's a point about the increasing number of those board games with figures kind of two foot square yes tables with figures on it that people get to paint but also quite board gaming and kind of mix we yeah so many of those around now and i think those can things run quite well in that kind of environment and you do see a few kind of those places around but um well, it's more the pop-up isn't it like yeah, you said pop-ups. earlier so people will take over a pub or take over a, yeah. a, a shop even for a, a week or a day or two to get the game. I have seen a few cafes, but it's very occasional rather than a permanent setup. Yeah, I, I thought that um, property prices would be um, an issue. You know, uh, we've got loads of dish. I don't want to go all dark satanic mills on you, but we've got loads of disused industrial buildings around uh, Leeds. And um, there's a lad who's set up and he's got like a little shop with paints and games workshop stuff and a, and a bit of this and that. And then this huge area that used to be a, work, a machinery workshop, six foot four, six by four tables in there, charge people a few quid per hour, and lads doing a decent, you know, earning from it. So um, yeah. good luck, good luck really to good. him. Yeah. Um, shop shops wise in London, I remember when I were a lad, um, there used to be. Uh, I used to get off a trade at Euston, and there was a shop just round the corner there. I can't remember what it was yeah, called. Yeah, Gamers in Exile. Gamers in Exile. Peter Tool. Great guy, wonderful yeah. shop. And I was a regular. I, if you ask me about shops in London, I'm I'm the expert. I used to, when I was 16, come up by bus and visit them all, including Sir and Willie's on Sloan Sloan Street, which like wow. how we got a premise there, I'll never know because that's probably the most expensive retail in London. But yeah, amazing shops. Um, Games in Exile uh, had an, a club attached to it and everything. It was a, it was a great shop. It was a shop for gamers by gamers. Yeah, lovely place. And um, Nav War is that? So he's he's just closing down, isn't he? Is he in London? Still, I can't remember. I think he's Essex technically. Is he right? Essex? Where is he? Yeah. But yeah, no. It's all, I think, it's I all south of Northampton. <laughs> I think he's still going. He's, he's, I think he said that he's closing within five weeks, something like that. Oh, okay. his, uh, it was recent announcement. Um, and I think the shop that I've been to when I've uh, ventured um, into the capital has been Orks Nest. Yes, uh, yes, that's yeah. still going. Yeah, they, they seem to have a bit of historical stuff in there, and it's a it's a decent trip. At one point, I think there was probably half a dozen really good war game shops within central London. And um, Dave Rota was running, you know, the minifig shop just in Victoria. There was a soldier shop on Charing Cross railway station. There was loads of little pop ups all over the place, and tradition at Piccadilly, 
There was just loads of them uh, under two flags at St. Christopher's Place. There weren't necessarily war games, but soldier shops. And you, you know, I spent many, my, many hours <laughs> and much of my money <laughs> in those shops that took a fair amount of my early wages. So I know them very well. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, I love a bit of no nostalgia. I certainly went to tradition a few times um, on my way to the Imperial War Museum when I was younger. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder, for, a, for a young lad um, yeah. to see all those painted soldiers in the window, it's, it was just absolutely amazing. And, yeah. and no, no wonder I'm still hooked to, yeah. today, as, as, as we all are. Um, so you were saying, then, Martin, you're, you're a big Napoleonics man. Is that your your go-to period would you say oh gosh that's a very good question <laughs> i've got so <laughs> many periods and so many vast armies yes uh 1813 18 no, sorry 1812 to 1814 is, i'm really interested but early revolutionary wars 1792 to 1800 that's that's a big thing i've got lots of 15s in that um i've got a very large sudan force which is a, another story um, and South America, I talked about Wellington in India, elephants. Ooh, right, yes, that's so quite a rare one. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. a cracking fun play with that. I have to say, that's a good game. That that's is a great game. Really enjoyed that. So yeah, I've got yeah. I suppose American Civil War in two scales, fifteen and twenty eight. Wow. So <laughs> I've got yeah, yeah. But probably Napoleonic's is. I keep returning to my first love. I keep being drawn back to it. I'm mm. a bit weird in that even with the airfix, I never did ancients. And I never did World War Two. Don't know why Ooh. I was stuck in that. To this day, dabbled in medieval. a bit of Italian wars. I've got oh. a whole Italian war story I can tell you about later. But oh, uh, oh, never really got into anything later than the Boer War and anything earlier than the War of the Roses. Oh, so we've got an interesting mix between us then. So, yeah. Phil, you were the you were the World War Two guy. You were saying during your yeah, your introduction, absolutely. and um, was it the technical side of that that sort of got lit your light bulb if you like i think um partly that partly i just got reading that kind of those kind of books early and watch all the war films that we all did etc also frankly i think looking back um a lot of the guys i used to hang around with my dads and the granddads and the farmers mm. and the gamekeepers a few of them worked in italy right world war ii so they used to tell yeah. stories and that probably inspired my yeah interest in the history a bit more as well um so yeah, she so had some good tales. So I suspect it was that kind of thing. And then I was just an avid reader. So I basically read, 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 read all those, you know, massive great tombs in the library that nobody else borrowed on <laughs> various things. All the ones yeah. that were out of date, out of date five minutes after they discovered that um, um, we cracked their codes. Books that said Montgomery was a genius for 30 years until you realize he's actually been reading their mail. Yeah, you know, all that, those kind of books. <laughs> I read those kind of books big time. So I think that, and um, yeah, and I think the technical stuff, I was also just, obsessed with how it worked how did you get that tank from where it started to there running around france i was some reason i got really into logistics i just couldn't understand why and um there's there's the knee holster so i started i discovered knee holster the guy who does all the all bats yeah i've got i got a stack of those and i have no i just got obsessed with going yeah God, I can't believe they've got the mobile butchers unit in the back of this division to, to, to feed the troops. Yeah, that kind of level of detail. I got yeah. So probably technical stuff. You write is the way into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and did did you ever go backwards in time? Then have you do, ever done any ancients or medieval that sort of I, stuff? I will happily play anything anybody puts on the table. Okay, I can clear. confirm that. Yeah. To be fair, this man has played one World War Two game with me. Where he oh, said, brilliant. what do I do? I said, pretend they're, pretend they're, pretend there's most solid infantry are cavalry and just act the same way. And it worked quite well, really. Quite okay, well, it worked yeah. quite really. Oh, oh, impressed. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I have. I've, I've gone backwards and forwards. Um, I said board games, especially, and he's going to play board game wise. But in terms of figures, I've got some Sudanese in kind of 10 mil. Uh, I said, I've got some, uh, uh, a few ancients. I've got a bunch of, you know, Saxon type things for playing, um, I'm in the name of the game at the moment, sorry, I completely failed. Um, uh, uh, various games of Saxon stuff, but also I've got a bit of the you know, light sci fi stuff like Dust, the kind of weird World yeah. War II. Yeah. Again, that, yeah. That, again, there's a link to that. It feels like World War II, you know, thing. So that kind of thing as well. And um, like I said, my Victoriana kind of semi historical, pulpy nonsense, just from a light relief. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, my love, is, my love is I, I can bore everybody to death uh, with World War II. I mean, 
Uh, and, and the last thing I'm working, I've just finished doing actually is the gang have got a big kind of 1930s imagination uh, set up with O group rules. Oh, right, we're yeah. doing, you know, kind of Ruritanians and stuff with, you know, random under 35 Ts. My contribution is I've recreated a slightly enhanced British experimental mechanized force, medium Mark threes, Morris Martlets, all that nonsense running around uh, on the table too. So all the all the Heath all the Heath Robinson stuff. Yeah, yeah, all, all, but all the stuff that really was existing in 1930 yeah. experimenting with, but they shut down. That would have been in France in 1939. But anyway, that side. Mm. But yeah, that kind of stuff. So I like that kind of pushing the envelope of what was real by keeping it real. Mm. And are you guys um, mostly into gaming for the fun of it, or is there a competition element with either of you? Totally fun. Totally, totally fun. fun. Socially, social and fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, obviously, I like blowing up the other guy's tank. Let's not, oh, let's yeah. not, of course we do, but it's not the reason I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, so it's 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 historical um, rather than points based, and and we'll, there'll be a question on that in the quiz later on. Mm. I'm sure you're aware of. Um, so uh, we'll move on then to the South London Warlords itself, and um, first of all, a big tick in the box because one of the one of the things I've moaned about endlessly on this podcast for three years now is boring war games club names, and it's always. Chooks being district war game society and mm -hmm. all that sort of. I mean, we I can't, you know, Leeds War Games Club. How long did it take them to think that up in the 1970s? With all that fancy wallpaper and orange toilets and stuff, you think they could have come up with something better than Leeds War Games Club? So, do you know the do you know the origins of the name South London Warlords? Do you know where it comes from? No, I think it, it, we were originally a modelling club, and that's where it came from. Oh, right. From. And I think they wanted to, as you said, make something a bit different. And I think fantasy, you know, many things have brought out that fantasy collection. I think fantasy and warlocks and all that was all the rage at the time. I'm guessing, I don't really know, but it may be that's the reason. Yeah, I mean, we changed from Bermondsey Modelling and Something Club. Yeah. It's on the website, history, this stuff. Um, yeah, I suspect some bright soul to sort of sound good. Frankly, I don't suppose it's much better than that plan. It was kind of, I mean, this is 1970, God knows when this was done. So before even my time. Okay. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it just came from a, a cunning way of, uh, uh, of expressing the club's purposes. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a club in Manchester. I don't know if it's still in existence. It used to run a a big show that in, in that neck of the woods called Mailed Fist, oh, yes. um, yeah, yeah. And, and that always kind of that was a bit of a macho thing going on there. I think <laughs> uh, much much better than the uh, Burnley and District modelling and railway stroke wargaming society. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that, enough of me moaning. Um, so. Club wise, then it, it's been it's obviously quite established. Um, how long is it? Do you know how long it's been going on? Since 1971. 71, wow, it's when it was first started, I think. Yeah, so that would have been then because I think Leeds, the Leeds Club, is a similar sort of age, um, kind of in the the dawn of the club scene, really. I would imagine that that would have been one of the first kind of yes regular club, club scene you don't mean raving in the warehouse don't you i'm just checking we're in the same <laughs> tone here just yeah exactly That's, just checking yeah just get me whistle out yeah be string the vest, time, be um, dave rota he's quite an uh, from the 70s he's quite an old a good name and bill brewer who used to run a uh, um, stamp and yes. war game shop the two of them and jim shields founded it, yeah 1971 obviously it's been developed a hell of a lot since then um you know, the club's just grown and grown and grown. You know, people like John Treadway are very well known in the war game circles. You know, they put a lot of effort in. Brian Cameron, you know, Harry Hamilton, all those people have built the club up to where it is today. There's a there's a real history of yeah. dedicated hard work to uh, get it where it is today. And we're sort of we're not quite riding on the back of it, but it's built on the, their hard work. Yeah. And we can name lots of people. I mean we named a few but I mean we shouldn't just name names. No, no, no. They always pick yeah. somebody else, but you know, yeah. So yeah, seventy one with a few people, and then it's, it's generations, of course, isn't it? Right? You get you get a generation of people pushing through. People retire. People have the next generation takes it over. But we probably on you know fourth or fifth generation of kind of the club being running many yeah, ways. Yeah, so, that's yeah, a good yeah. way of looking at it. Yeah, 
Yeah. So where whereabouts is the clubhouse or where do, whereabouts do you meet? Well, we meet in Dulwich Village in a parish hall, which um, right. anyone who knows London will raise an eyebrow and say, Dulwich? It's probably the most, some of the most expensive retail in, uh, sorry, <laughs> most expensive estate, but it's very well situated and it's a, it is a parish hall and um, it's a great venue. We're able to store stuff. That's the big plus. Yes. Is to store stuff, which is um, different from a lot of clubs. So all our equipment and stuff we put in cupboards. So yeah, it's a great venue. Is that um, South of the River? Definitely. Definitely. South London Walls. Yeah. Yeah. So the name. So, yeah, so yes, it's South of the River. It's sort of, you know, kind of half, call it, call it halfway out to the M25 for those of you with limited geographical southern knowledge, like your good self. Okay. That's so, me, so, yeah. And it's, yeah, and like I said, the advantage is we get access by night, we can store stuff in cupboards, uh, we meet every Monday night, we also have regular Saturdays about once a month, all day Saturday. So we've got real yeah. big games through. And I mean some real big games. Um, mm. Yeah, so it's been a really good good venue for us. And, and how how long have you been uh, at the Dulwich place then? Oh. Probably about 30 years, I think. Yeah. Oh, right. so a good long time then. Yeah. yeah. Good, yeah. Good yeah. We have looked at other venues, but nothing quite meets everyone's requirements. And, uh, you know, in the introduction of the Ulysses zone and things like that caused a bit of a rupture in the com the group. But oh, I bet. Over that. I bet. Ooh, ooh, I bet. Yeah. We throw throwing darts at Sadiq Khan on the <laughs> on the dartboard. But well, there you it. go, we come through it. Yeah. 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 So um how many people or so what sort of size club is it? Well, okay, membership is one number. Because obviously <laughs> yeah. we're we're, we're, all, the same. we're, we're wide, the same. We're wide, I think. I mean, uh, we'll come back in a moment. I think on a reg on a regular night, we're probably getting 30, 40 people yeah. down on a Monday oh, night. Nice. Yeah. Um we can talk about the sort of games we how it works that way. And probably there's another, you know, signed up membership. We're probably done another twenty. So we're probably talking in, in the eighties yeah. of total membership. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some people who you know, moved away and, and stayed as members and we're quite happy about that and great. Um we've got a few unofficial members. We've got a outreach department in Hungary. Oh, uh, excellent, you know, excellent. So uh, who who bizarrely is running a show that looks a lot like Sloot these days, or slight, tried to in Hungary. So he's Janos, uh, ex member. So that's our that's our outreach station in Hungary. And we've got some associate members in France. Yes, yeah, associate <laughs> members in France too, okay, right as well. So they Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. We, 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 we've got lots of choices to go places to play games uh, as well, so yes. And what's the, the catchment area then? I think, you, Phil, you said you travel an hour in. Is, is, it, is it mostly people local to the hall or is it like yourself, Phil, people who are traveling wide, in? It's, it's pretty, pretty wide, yeah. There's, yeah. People, there's lots of people who walk there. There's lots of people who catch a bus and there's people who... who we drive i mean classically as people got older and retired people move out of london this is the classic london model isn't it you move out of yeah. london to somewhere else people sort of stay so um, come up here buy our houses go home at a weekend <laughs> oh i tell you yeah no i think it's a real mix it's a real mix obviously the most people there on a monday night it's going to be walking distance short drive buses but there are still people who do an hour or probably you know an hour and a half yeah. longer to get to the club yeah we're going we're gonna to have a little chat a bit later on when we're talking about Salute, about the age of the people who are organising it and, and, and how that could affect the future. Um, how is how is the age range at your club? We're, we're seeing occasionally we're getting new members. We've got a new lad who's come in who's 17, really enthusiastic. Um, are you getting that, that next generation? Are they starting to appear? I just want to, this is a great opportunity to absolutely praise Phil because up mm -hmm. until about three or four years ago, the club was greying and we weren't getting many new members. Yeah. And in the last three years, we've attracted quite a lot of younger members and we've attracted some people who've got fantastic social media skills. And that has then been able enabled us, we've opened up, we're obviously trying to change to attract more younger players and that's enabled us to attract a lot more younger players. And I think mm -hmm. I'd always go as far as probably like when I say younger, I'm talking about under 30 or under under 35, probably. So we, I think we're nearly, let's say, 40 percent are under 35, would you say? Yeah. 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 And I mean, oh. a big shout out to our, I mean, Chairman Carl, OK, he's actually the chairman of the club. OK, big shout out to Carl, he's really pushed that along about mm -hmm. ideas for that. And of course, once you get a few 
the young millennials, as I refer to them, because mm. they call me a boomer, so I call them millennials. They, once they get in the door, obviously they, they, they create a buzz and they suck ideas in, they've got new ideas. So I think, you know, we've definitely seen a big uptick in membership. I think lots, also, to be fair, quite a few returnees. Oh, I didn't know there was a war games club in my area. Mm, I used yeah. to do that 20 years ago in the attic, dusting out their Warhammer and their 28 mil engines. And next thing you know, they're playing. So we've got quite a few of those actually yeah. coming back as well. Kind of returnees is also quite a big boom. Oh, that's lovely to hear. I, I like to, to, to hear war games clubs thriving. I think uh, we dipped a little bit, but I feel like we're coming on the way back up again now. And yeah. as you as yourselves, we're, we're getting a few newer, younger members in who kind of bring new ideas and, and everything in, which is fantastic to hear. Um, so um, moving on from the club itself, just a, a quick thing. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about Salute. Um, but uh, do you guys travel to other war game shows um how far do you go um uh, are you there? is that your brief yeah stealing, stealing ideas no yes stealing ideas absolutely yeah totally lots of great ideas from other shows there's some fantastic shows out there but part of my brief is to go and look at war game shows and try and you know soft soap people into coming to salute because there's some fantastic games out there and we'd love them to come to salute and we you know i go around inviting people and great clubs shrewsbury club's a great club put some fantastic games love to get them to salute and we talk to them about that that's part of what i'm doing but um i try to think what the show was in nottingham i went to and uh, they had some great ideas there about the way they ran it the way they talked to people the way they engaged with fellow gamers and I thought, oh, there's a lot we can learn from that. Uh, BrickCon, that was it, BrickCon. Yeah. Um, but the guy running that is a professional show organiser. And, you know, Salute is run by literally a handful of amateurs. But there's some very slick, well-run shows out there. And um, it, the, it's, the devil's in the detail, but some of the things that other people do is very, very good. And obviously, Partizan, the two Partizans, Hammerhead, they're great shows. And I, um, I really enjoy going to those. Uh, Colours, Warfare. Mm -hmm. You know, great shows. They're the ones I, I, I easily can get to. And obviously, Fiasco in, in Leeds. Obviously. obviously. Yeah. Yeah. It just goes without saying that, doesn't it? I didn't it's want to good. mention it just because it was so obvious that was a I'd show. I'd be occasional visitor to Joy of Six in Sheffield. Yes. Just oh, right, yes. Just north of the river. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe I believe that I am going to be. I've been co-opted onto the panel that they have there. Excellent. So that's, going be, that's going to be an interesting day out. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. We'll see. We'll I, see what I spent a lot of my career in Leeds, and about ten percent of my working life was spent in Leeds. So, wow. uh, as much as I love the city, I find it very hard to go back at the weekends. Yeah, no. To work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last thing you want to do is remember work. Uh, very true. Um, so we, we finished this section off with what we call the Venn diagram of Wargaming. Uh, and that's where I'm, I'm going to ask each of you to kind of break down your hobby into four sections. And that's Wargamer, Painter, Collector and Historian. And um, just see how those different pieces fit together and, and kind of describe the way that you look at the hobby. Because uh, it's a many faceted thing. There's many different ways to approach it. Uh, so, so, Phil, how would you see yourself in in those four? Uh, anybody who's seen my stuff, not a painter under any right. okay. <laughs> I paint, I paint because I have to, because I'll take abuse if I bring a non paint figure to the club again. That's the only reason I paint. Um, I happily pay somebody else. I appreciate it. I, I think the art's amazing, but I can't do it, and I'm terrible. Um, so, that modeler, if I have to. To build random things that nobody else makes i will but again i'm not fabulous i have great ideas my ideas are amazing yeah. always amazing i have a great imagination my implementation is awful okay so that's the thing but people are very kind to me about that um i think i'm definitely a war gamer uh, i want to i want to play games i want to write rules i want to i've never read i've never read a rule set that could be improved on my finely honed editions <laughs> again exactly. half the club's laughing at this point uh and um indeed many people and also historian i really like you know i want it to be i've mellowed i'm no longer the complete mad rivet counter when it comes to taking historical fact into a game it's got to be a game you've got to be able to play it in three hours somebody else got to play it with you so I, my venn diagram of history has probably reduced a bit and the game of bits increased as i've realized life's too short to to read 80 pages and 47 reference tables you know what i mean you know what i mean yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I do. And um, do you, do you, the the one we didn't cover really was collector. So have you got a uh, a wide range of figures in the house? I've got a wide range of a small number of figures. Let's put it that way. Okay, right. I, I dabble into things. I, I'm also I'm quite ruthless. If 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 I buy something, I tend to buy painted stuff and all paint. If I buy it and go, I'm not really using this. I I, I don't have much other than my 10 mil World War Two stuff, which has been consistent. Mm. Stuff comes and goes quite rapidly. Um, yeah, really. I, I'm quite ruthless about this. I mean, when I was less well off for a start and had you know and before you know we now i'm you know approaching retirement not yet and i've got a bit more you know disposable income i care less you know ebay is a bit more fluid but um and i'll get people to pay stuff but in my younger days because i couldn't afford it i was pretty ruthless about what i had so collector no you're quite happy you're not uh sentimental about the stuff that you've got you're quite happy to bang uh, it on ebay and pass bits, it on few bits not yeah. bits, few bits board yeah. games I've got, I've got, my board game collection is enormous but that's still an issue <laughs> what about yourself then martin what's your venn diagram like good question i'd love to tell you in my heart of hearts that i'm a war gamer and i yeah. play but unfortunately one of the problems i found is you need to be in the uk and in the country to play war games with people and I travel quite a lot, so that makes it quite difficult. But when I am in the country, I do like playing war games. But by default, I've become a collector, much to my embarrassment. Um, so I've got large collections, which I don't play with as nowhere near as often as I should. I love modelling and making stuff. I'm really into my terrain and scenery. Um, yeah. I love the history. I've constantly got history books by the side of my bed, so I'd have to tell you that. Um, love painting. Oh, well, that way I outsource most of it. Uh, uh, the new bloody miniatures that have come out for the English Civil War. Yes, oh, yes. I, just, I can't resist them. I keep buying them and I paint those. And I'm probably painting more figures now than I've ever done in my life. Wow. Um, and I take them away with me sometimes on holiday to paint them. Um, but I paint more figures than ever before. But um, in terms of my overall collections, there's what I've painted is a, a tiny, embarrassing percentage. So mm. I'd have to say collector, historian, war gamer. What was the third or fourth one? Uh, war game, uh, war game, a painter, collector, historian, historian. Yeah. To be yeah. fair, I expect the reality is that whatever people say is the percentage of war gaming versus collecting is wrong. <laughs> I guarantee the <laughs> truth is that you know it's true. Is it the truth is the collector bubble is easily twice the size of the gaming bubble for most people because yeah. we're all yeah. like a bunch of magpies, aren't we? Yeah, mine's my, mine's absolutely massive. I mean, those glass cabinets behind me are just absolutely rammed full of figures um so there's stuff in there i probably haven't gamed with for 15 years or more oh, um, naughty, naughty. it'll come back if it'll come back round eventually yeah, we'll get there we'll get there in the end we'll get there in the end well thank you very much gentlemen that's been a lovely introduction and um it's time for a little break now for the audience and we'll be back in a second with our big game chat Okay, it's uh, the second part of the podcast, and uh, you will all know by now that this is our big game chat, and whether you bloody like it or not, we're talking about big games, uh, because that's what this podcast was set up for. Um, and uh, the first kind of question that I always ask everyone who comes on um, is, how would you define a big game? So, Marty, what's a big game to you? What does that conjure in your mind? Well, I've been very fortunate. I've played in some very big games. I think, um, I don't even remember, Mike Hinkley used to run the AB Miniatures. He yeah. had a big 24 by 36 foot tables down in Wales. And I was fortunate to play a couple of those. And those were huge games. And, uh, you know, the sort of things that Mark Freeth does, I've been invited to those a few times. They're fantastic. I've got a, very fortunate, I have a garden shed where um, I've got a table tennis set up, table tennis table Ooh, set up. Yeah, nice. And, uh, very often that's covered with, you know, several thousand figures, um, especially the Sudan. You can't never have enough Mardists and no. uh, you can have some great games there. So that, that for me, if you've got three or four players aside and thousands of figures on the table, that is a big game. Uh, Phil, have you got a similar definition? Or yeah, different I, I, um, it's width, there's width and time, isn't there? Okay. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. You know, spending all day on a complicated six by five table, which we, we have the privilege of doing on Saturday once a month at the club is great too, or a seven by, you know, a standard size table, just a bit bigger. 
I think that's a really big game that so uh, I've played quite a few of those. Um uh, with my colleagues Tony put on a big impetus uh, crusader game which was all day, it was great fun. I've also said I played the big mega games, which is all day two hundred people, and that obviously not classic war gaming, but still board gaming still going. And also, you know, I I've put on a couple of big, big games, uh, both in their own rights, but also as part of campaigns as well. So mm. kind of I'm I'm bending the definition here a bit of things. Probably the biggest oh, game right. I think I've actually played on is, is a Saturday game with a massive um, table playing Ancients uh, back probably 15 years ago now, which is, I knew nothing about Ancients. It was a great hoot. But yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to stretch all the definitions on the, what is big. Yeah, no, it's be, people have different ideas and, that, and that's lovely to hear how they, they see things differently. Um, the You mentioned a few times, both of you, the Sudan. Um, are you players of the classic Gilda Sands of Sudan rules? Is, is, that, uh, is that what you enjoy? Yeah, so I, um, by accident, stumbled into the Sudan <clears throat> one drunken evening and um, I sort of built up a collection from a silly mistake I made. And then I happened to bump <laughs> into uh, Dave Doherty. And, oh, uh, man of a thousand camels. Yeah, then it became almost like a, an arms race and we were comparing <laughs> units. Um, it, it got out of control. It's still out of control. I'm still adding units. Uh, so 15 years after I started. In that hub race, well, an arms race. I can say a hub race is a good yeah. one. I like that, Phil. I like that one. So, yeah, I've got the Sudan's great fun. I, I, I also, I read the rules. I love the rules. Uh, I've played the game once. I'll play it again. Complete hoot. Uh, yeah, I like it too. Kind of two reasons. That the kind of classic, it's classic daring do stuff, isn't it? Okay, yes. in, in that way. Yeah. I also, I'm, I'm really, this is the historical bit of the game, but I love the asymmetrical stuff. Yeah. You know, Colonial warfare, asymmetrical stuff. I'm, oh, that's the other thing I'm obsessed with. I forgot to mention is I've got a long-standing collection of 15 mil planes wall stuff, which I went out every so often to general amusement. But I, I pretty, I've taken a pretty serious thought of route to that stuff, and I really interested. So asymmetrical Sudan's great for that. I quite like all the players on one side games. Yes, yes. Against the system, which is yeah. great because then the system tends to. You know, screw you over. Bend people's minds a bit, doesn't it? That's the yeah. you over. Okay, yeah, I agree. I, agree. I like that idea because it's all, all of you against the game is quite a fun uh, operation too, like that. So, which is probably suitable in some way. Um, but also, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit with a, with a bit of revisionists. I'm quite impressed with, you know, you know uh, how you get a bunch of modists to charge a machine gun in 1890s. Pretty amazing stuff as well, isn't it? Okay, so all that from the mix of stuff makes it interesting to me. Yeah, the I mean the Sands of Sudan and I think Pony Wars, isn't it? Is the uh, yeah. is the North American uh, kind of verse, very similar mechanisms and and Vietnam is one that tends to lend itself to a you know players playing Americans and a umpire controlled enemy, uh, and it's a it's a different style of gaming, isn't it? To and it brings different challenges and um, you kind of all working as a team rather than a, opposing each other. Yeah. I love umpiring games. I, 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 I would happily umpire a game and have four people playing my game and umpire it as much as play it because I just like seeing it work and seeing it play out in the way I hoped it would. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very much the same. I, I umpire a lot and when I'm at shows, I'm talking to people so I'm not playing the game um, half the time. I've got a clue what's going on. Just <laughs> engage with the public. I don't know anything that's going on in the, in the background. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, Martin about going along to uh, the War Games Holiday Centre with Mark Freeth. What's what's some of the games that you've done there with him? Well, again through that flipping rule writer Dave Brown, who suckered me into buying every set he's ever written. Um, he's I've been very very fortunate in that I met him many many years ago with his friends and. I've played at the Loughton Club a few times, and when they get together with Mark Freeth, uh, they very kindly invited me a few times to go along. And uh, I think we've played some, we've played, believe it or not, a 15 mil game of Leipzig, taking up all the tables with, I don't know, 6,000 figures or something. None were mine, but, um, and it was fantastic. Really, really enjoyed it. And um, we played last time, I think it was there last year, and we played um, part of Essling. Oh, no, Papa Dresden. Thank you, Papa Dresden. So Mark's such a great host. He's such a lovely He's man. Fantastic. And, um, you know, he knows what to do and keep things running along. So, yeah, I've Lingu played there. 
Um, Dave Brown, before Mark sort of came along, was running a whole series of games across London on quite uh, once a year on quite a mega scale. You know, we played Salamanca, uh, we played Vagram, we you know, but sometimes just parts, but sometimes, but with uh, you know, sometimes 10, 15 people aside, which is just an amazing experience. I've been very, very lucky. Did you ever get a chance to come up to the War Games Holiday Centre when it was up here in, in God's Own County? No, it was far too poor to travel oh, that far. Yeah. <clears throat> I used to ogle those games in the yeah. magazine. I mean, I'd have bitten my arm off to go, but yeah. I couldn't afford it either. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just don't, don't, don't call it the bleak Yorkshire Moors like Henry did. Henry yeah. Hyde. Bless him. Good lad, but I need, to, I need to take you for a day out at Scarborough when the sun's out. He'll, be, uh, he'll, he'll appreciate it more then. <laughs> the the new people who are coming along are, are they getting into the to large scale games or are they bringing the Warhammer forty k kind of four foot square or six by four? I think they they bring the you know bolt action. Uh, not my game, but it's a good way of introducing people to the hobby. And I think a lot of people are moving into bolt action, and I'm, we're hoping moving out of that into bigger games. Um, certainly with the introduction of General Army two. We're hoping to put on some big games on the club and sort of tempt people to the Napoleonic world <laughs> and say, look, uh, this is a, a good system. It will work really well. Yeah. Um, so we're Phil, Phil's, we're not, Phil's not looking convinced. No, no, I, 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 I love it. I'm really impressed by it and I love it. Yeah. Like I said, it's bizarre that I, said, I am a complete ribbit counter. You know, Panzer II Cs, I'll tell you the difference every time, okay? Yeah. You know, Boy, boy's death with French tanks. So in theory, it's completely in my group. I just never got into it. And the same with ACW as well. It's, it's just, and I play games. I love it. I just never got into it myself. And frankly, I don't have to because everybody else has got the gear. So I'll just wait for somebody to invite me to play and I'll play with somebody else's kit and explain the rules to me. It's fine. Uh, that, that's the way to do it, of course. That's the way, best way to play war gaming. Is somebody else's kit, somebody else's rules, somebody else's table. I've done all the hard work. You just turn up, roll the dice. So this is crap, and they walk yeah. off. Well, you've met Phil many times before, then. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> harsh, oh. harsh. I might have an occasional opinion on the old, old, old modifier. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> so, do you think it's um, kind of part of, of a club, not just South London War Lords, but any club, to um, kind of give that opportunity to people who are starting to have a go at something yeah. that maybe they can't do at home? Yeah, I, look, I think absolutely. I think that, okay. I said the club is really good at. There are people with thirty years worth of lead in their attic yes. who will happily share it. Okay, mm -hmm. and and also we've got quite a few young people who are actually writing rules or producing models these days and all that three D printing stuff. I don't understand and sculpting, and they're bringing along stuff. Let's try this. I've got an idea, and they're generating new stuff. Um, I would say, though, even though we've got people playing things like a bit of 40k around the corner, not much, and a few of those kind of one-on-one -on -one system games, most of the games on Monday night, you'll see four or five people sitting around the table playing a game. I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. And one of those people will be somebody that be their first time they've ever played that period or that rule set. Because, let's face it, as you say, you want to get your kit out of your cupboards, don't you? Yeah? Yeah. And you don't really yeah. care. Get on the table, get somebody playing with it. And so I think we're pretty good at that. Um, and it's just more fun with four of you than two of you. It's more entertaining and more, so not that going on. And mm. though we say about young people, the young people, God, sorry, the millennials, right? How, how they're condescending. Thing. Also, last Saturday, one of our millennials, until this, ran a massive one day World War II campaign. Wow. Multiple tables, maps, the full Monty with uh, 50, 15 mil? Yeah, 15 mil and their own rule set all day. Now, that was a big game, okay? And that yeah. was entirely run by definitely the younger half of the club. Wow. Fantastic to see. Fantastic to hear as well. Uh, On the really... other hand, we've got people who are playing um, Valor and Fortitude with minifig figures that are 40 years old, you know? Yes. Oh. And that, getting people into Napoleonics via that route. You know, whether you like the rules or not, it's a good way of getting people in. So, what do you call it? An introduction drug, or a... yeah, 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 entry, oh. entry drug. Entry yeah. drug, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, are those classic minifigs are they on? Are they just got green painted bases of stuck course. to card? Mm. Oh, now we're talking. Now none of that sculpted bases on that sort of aging thing. Uh, You've got to have yeah, the all, the ankles, all the ankles were rotting and falling yeah. over. Yeah, from lead rot. Yeah, yeah. I, I always had that with minifigs. Is that they, 
they'd just fall over randomly halfway through a game. I'm sure I didn't touch half of them. It's... <laughs> Yeah, but there we go. Um, do you think um, there's a chance? I mean, obviously, smaller games are the thing at the moment with every new rule set that comes out. Do you think there's a future for big games? Do you think they'll come back into fashion? I'm certainly trying to make them. Yeah, yeah. I think... Well, big game Saturday is very popular. We yeah. play these, you know, and people do come along. It's not like you go in there. There's only one game. There's, you know, there's often two or three games. So. Yeah. And it's a mixture of people of different age groups playing. So that's really good. Um, yeah, I think it's a slow process, isn't it? Because as people go through that, their career in wargaming, you're right, we didn't really have, when we were starting out, a small game format. But on a Monday night, if you've only got two or three hours, a small game format's quite useful and it gets you yeah. into it. Um, um, and the big game Saturday, I mean, you see, I don't know, whatever 2,000 points is of some GW game being played, that's a big game. Um, there's a big a bunch have got the uh, uh, Uncharted Seas stuff from years ago, and they and they play mass. I mean, some really big games out all day. So that kind of stuff gets people take up to Saturday to roll out, you know, multiple tables of the kind of classic points based system stuff. But like I said also, I think um, we got quite a few people, and I'm one of them. He likes a bit of a campaign game or a bit of a kind of just a bit more than the average table. But you know, I think I think if Nobody's going to go straight to the club and start putting out a 12 foot wide table with 4,000 inches, are they? So I think you've got to accept that horses for courses. I, I mean, I'd rather have 10 small games on a Saturday than two big ones. You know what I mean? In terms do, you, of do, you have, do you have a lot of space at the clubhouse to, you know, could you run three or four bigger games uh, on a Saturday? Yes, easily. Yeah, very yeah, easily. Yeah. yeah, there's lots of space. Yeah. I mean, on a, on a, we could probably fit in. Uh, hang on, do a quick calculation. It, well, easily on a, on a busy night, on, on some nights we're like, we're going to run a large day one of these days. In theory, we worked out we put 16 six by five tables in the hall. Yeah. And we've got space at the back. So, do your translation. You could probably put in four, five, six, you know, 15 foot, 20 foot games in there and still have room. It's a big hall. It's like one of those classic, massive, big church halls. They do. It's got a stage. They do, and we do, what we're talking about is scary. We're not talking the cub hut here. We're talking. Um, it's got a stage. It's got lights. It's big enough to run a pantomime every year, which annoys us because we get kicked out every. <laughs> year for that, which is really annoying. Um, yeah. Only we don't is obviously the response. Uh, we do get kicked out. Which is like, no. So yeah, it's that scale. So we're lucky to get that. And then, like I said, separately we've got the storage and space. So we 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 recognise we are immensely lucky that we have big space. It's got access on Saturday, access on Saturday, and our kit storage it makes a big difference. Yeah, and I, I put on a sixteen foot by six foot Wellington and India game because you need the space, you need the flags, yeah. everything. And uh, when I do that, nobody says, "Oh, you're taking all this space up." There's plenty of space for everyone else. So, yeah, oh, well, that's good. That's good to hear. I think um, you know, there's a, there's quite a few people I know who listen to this who like want to get into big gaming and maybe don't have an opportunity at home. And and clubs um, are yeah. one of the best ways of doing it because like you say you've got the old, those old crusties with our 30 years of lead lying around uh that we absolutely want to get out on the table uh, and share with other people so uh yeah great little uh big game chat there we shall move on to our feature section Hello, we are back with section three. And as everyone knows, this is our features section with the world famous Yorkshire Gamer Quiz. And uh, the usual disclaimer, this is not designed to upset you. This is not about your war gaming. This is about us having a laugh and a joke uh, while we're having a quiz. Uh, so uh, the rules of the rules of uh, conduct are uh, the normally straightforward yes or no answers or one or the other there is a massive yorkshire bias in the right answers uh, to these questions and um, if you want to stop and have a chat about any of them we will we will do so and uh, when we've had multiple guests on before what we've uh, done is we've just asked one question and then got the answer from both of you at the same right. time rather than flipping through it twice so, question one. Um, we'll start with Phil. Go big or go home? Uh, go big. Go big. Martin? Go big. Go big. Excellent. Well done. Started well. Uh, question two. Uh, we'll flip this round. So, uh, Martin, contrast paints, great or a gimmick? 
complete gimmick. Gimmick. Good lad. You don't care, do you, Phil? Because you don't paint. Gimmick. gimmick. Therefore, all paints are gimmicks to me. <laughs> Um, paintbrushes, uh, Phil, another one for you that might uh, uh, not make a lot of sense. Uh, Windsor and Newton, which are really posh and made down south, or Pro Art, which are made in Yorkshire and skipped. Pro Art, clearly. Clearly Pro clearly. Art. Clearly. Martin? I'm a bit skin flint, so Pro Art every time. Good lad, good lad. My, uh, my lad bought me a Windsor and Newton brush for my birthday. So I'm going to have to try it out and see see how it like see how it goes see how it goes. It's sat in it's sat at one corner of my paint table away from all the pro art brushes in case <laughs> they, they gang up on it. <laughs> right, question four. Um, I can't remember which way around we were, but we'll go fill. Um, Ninety six figures, an army or a unit of pike? Oh, it's a unit. Unit. Oh, excellent, Martin. Yeah, absolutely. A unit. My English Civil War units are similar sizes. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up now so I don't get angry during the salute thing. <laughs> um who organizes your painting competition? It's changed over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are we always we 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 have shared responsibility as a committee, so shoot now and we'll answer on your behalf without go okay, good. Right. I'll go out to the painting competition, historical war games unit, maximum number of figures, 40. <laughs> I've got okay. skirmish units that are 40 figures. To be fair, to be fair, that's not the current organisers' problem, okay, right? That is a historical category since about 1972, okay, right? So we will take your views under advisement and let, let you know what you think about it. Well, I'll pass that on to to. Uh, I will name name you because he's doing a great job. Stefan, who's run the paint competition, did a great job last yeah. year. He's going to improve this year a lot as well. We will pass on that thought to him. I okay. think the issue is we need space in the cabinet for all the units. And if we allow one of your 60 figure units in there or 90 figure units, it might, might not be room for anyone else. I know, but 48, 48 is the smallest pipe block I've got. <laughs> and that's like a baby half block. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying. We're, we'll 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 refer that to the committee for later consideration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. Noted. Uh, six by four table. Is that a big game or a small game, Martin? Well, if you're using six mil figures, it is you can get quite a lot on that. But for me, with twenty eights and fifteens, it was largely my collection. Mm. Um, I'd call that a small game. But not small you game. can have a lot of fun with a small game. You can. It's not. It's, I, I never said better. I just said yeah. big or small. I know it's upset it, it, in the past. Go it's on, a Tom. small. It's a small game. Six by four is a small game. Excellent. That's what I like. Um, question six. Uh, stay with you, Phil. Points based army or historical order of battle? Oh God, historical order of battle. Oh, excellent, Martin. I can't believe you're even asking me that question. <laughs> yeah, we're offended. We're, we're leaving. Offended. We're both offended. So appalling offended. We're leaving now. I, 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 I never even. I rip those pages out of the rules when I get them. No, historical order of battle. It's 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 a it's amazing how um, war gamers. It seems points are very marmite with war gamers. I've never. I've hardly ever met anyone who's gone. Oh well, I don't mind occasionally. I'll do points. Whereas I, it'd be, oh, I love building my lists, or I absolutely hate this. Order of battle. To be fair, to be fair, okay, uh, just put nuance on your question because you know nuance. To be fair, there, you know, if you want to do just a pick up and play game, even a historical game, mm. it's no, uh, if you've got a clever scenario, it's great. Isn't it? Okay. If you haven't got a clever scenario, points have a bit of a function in broad terms of making sure that somebody's not going to have a boring night for three hours. Yeah, Do you viewers, know what I mean? viewers, viewers might be able to hear Martin shaking his head in the background there. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, I'm just saying, and obviously, he I do, a point. and occasionally, I do delve into things like dust, right? Mm. Where it's, I, 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 I mean, I bend rules all the time on those things, and we have scenarios, but you know, you've got to be a bit the idea is have fun for two people or four people to have fun, is it right? If you get it wrong, completely wrong in terms of an unbalanced scenario, as long as we know it's unbalanced, but you've got a chance of. Doing a good job and losing, nobody minds that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? You know what I mean? You have to deploy it carefully a bit, I think. That's all. Yeah. Hard works in the scenario design, that's where you've got to put the hours. Yeah. I think I think anybody of our age will kind of remember those 
um, WRG army lists and, um, you know, half half a point extra for bronze greaves and yeah. uh, take off one point for two feathers in the hat instead of three and yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And that's kind of probably what put me off. I think those feathers are very important, though, for identification and command and control, I think, of finds are worth at least two points. <laughs> at least, at least two points. Uh, question seven. Um, another, another painting question, Phil, so we'll start with you. Um, wet palette to mix your paints or an old bit of MDF? I don't even understand the question. <laughs> but What's this paint? Old bit of MDF. When I do it, old bit of MDF. Oh, excellent. Martin? Well, I keep experimenting with a wet palette, but it keeps going mouldy and smelly, and I have to keep throwing them away. I've just got a Tupperware dish with, you know, a bit of Kleenex. So I'm... I don't want to throw it out, but it's, you know, I'm struggling with it. So, yeah, I have to say, I'm mean, normally just got a bit of old MDF, something lying around. In fact, anything lying around. Yeah. Yogurt pots, anything. How many times has your old bit of MDF gone mouldy? <laughs> Never. Are you, are you suggesting it's a, it's a shallow marketing ploy by any chance? Is that what you're suggesting? A wet palette? Uh... <laughs> you said he brought that extra large one out. Um, I think it was Army Paint. I'll, 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 I'll say names. I don't care. Um, Army Painter. They brought one out. XL wet palette is crazy. We expect we're expecting another virus to come along, and we need to be getting the growing the cultures in the bottom of this extra large <laughs> Army Painter to get a vaccination. Anyway, never mind. Right. So, um, question eight. Um, Martin, undercoating figures. Are you black or white? Uh, that's a very good question. I changed, but mostly black. Mostly black. Good. Black it makes it makes even my painting look vaguely sane, and white's for clever people. Well, Austrians yeah. are good in white. If you're painting loads of Austrians, white can be quite useful with a wash yeah. on or something. Remember, yeah. remember, not the Napoleonics. Come on, no, keep no, up. No. Okay. Keep up. <laughs> so no, black, black hides a multitude of sins. Thank you very much. You, you don't, you're doing you're all doing extremely well at the moment. I have to say. <laughs> it won't last. Um, <laughs> Question question nine is the hot drink question, um, and that's uh, would you have Yorkshire tea or dirty mucky coffee? Let's start with Phil. Uh, I, I'm a fully signed up five cup a day coffee addict. Oh, Martin, you're talking to Mr. Cappuccino. Oh, and <laughs> you, and you, that southern line would come in somewhere. <laughs> oh. Bloody coffee. Oh, dear. Anyway, uh, question 10, coming halfway through. Um, War Games units, um, do you like the figures, obviously, if it's historically correct, do you like the figures tightly packed or socially distanced? Martin. So definitely tightly packed, and I actually experiment with figures before I actually put them on base to see how tight I can get them. Oh, so I get the minimum come in. Uh, base possible. So, yes, I'm currently basing some Franco-Prussian, and I've got the Perry's 28s, and I've got them very, very tightly packed, even though I know they fought in open order. But for war games purposes, I've got them tightly packed. They look so much better. Phil? Uh, loose, thanks. Because loose. Of, partly because I do a lot of World War II stuff, and obviously I'm a cheapskate, so I have a big base and a few figures spread out because it's World War II. Nobody stands up, see? Works both ways. Yeah, three no, figures, no. I, three figures I, into the two. Thanks very much. Job done. I can see where you're coming from. I can see where you're coming. See, this is where the, the Venn diagram of wargaming comes in, you see, because you, you're not a big painter. So get a bigger base, less figures. Painters, like me and Martin, more figures, close together, looks better. Question 11. Um, Phil, would you like a two-hour club game or a weekend monster game? Oh, weekend monster game. Brilliant. Martin? Weekend monster game. Excellent. Right. Now, you you were both very predictable on the previous um, Southern question. So here's another one. Um, and this is avocado. Is it just posh, mushy peas? Uh, so, Phil. I'm afraid it's not just it's posh, mushy peas. Okay, right. You're not gonna. Well, you're not gonna name, give me a positive avocado story here. here yeah, you? my name's got Peter Manderson. Is basically what I was gonna say. So carry on. <laughs> I saw an advert yesterday for the first time ever for mashed peas. Not mushy. Yes. Not mashed. mashed. Yeah. Not seen that before. In defence, 
I have mushy peas every time with my fish and chips, just to be completely clear, okay? So in my defence. That's good. That's good. I might give you half a point for that. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, apparently mashed peas on toast is is like the new thing. Mm. Um, and some somebody, bless them, uh, sent me a message on Facebook to say they've got mashed peas on toast on Lorraine now. And it, it was on Lorraine Kelly on ITV in the, in the morning. Um, but it was all fancy with like shards of mozzarella and all that sort of oh, stuff. Fantastic. Shocking. Little as I know, I'll be discussing fruit on this show, but moving on. Yeah, when we get old, anything. We've, we've had fish, we've brought fish and chips up, which is always happens anyway. So that's always good to see. And in fact, there's one guy who's going to Skipton to visit a friend and he's visiting the fish and chip shop that we mentioned in the, the show that I did with Pro Arc and just to try out and see how good it is. So he's going to get back to me and tell me how good it is. Uh, question 13, the universal question. No, no pressure on either of you here but in the previous 52 episodes everyone has answered this question the same way um so we'll start with martin uh round dice no 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 no, no. no. round dice round dice yeah people round dice were used a few years ago and they're that, rubbish that passed right. me by i'm afraid the Excellent. round dice so no not round dice so banned the old banned. flippy coin dice one around it'd be interesting to see but anyway move on yeah, yeah. you've seen that you've seen that the new the, they said like a coin and you flip it, it lands and the and the little thick gem in the middle will roll out to one particular hole and give the score it's very it's very kind of you know fantasy yeah so it's like a coin and it lands and the, it will randomly put a little um small pebble gem bead into a mm. hole between one and ten or one and six it, it looks lovely but you know completely pointless i'm gonna have to find one of them i've not seen one of them oh yeah. i like that i like that because somebody's somebody's shown me a picture of a dice within a dice, so there's like a six-sided dice that's transparent, and then a ten-sided dice inside it. No, I'm with Carlo. White dice with clear numbers on. That's it. That, yeah. could, that could get you old and your eyesight's fading. Yeah, so probably that's is, why but... <laughs> Oh, uh, brilliant. Right. Um, so question 14, back to fish and chips. Um, it's supposed to be a wargaming podcast to know, but what the hell? Um, so this is this actually this question um, came up in, in one of the, the previous episodes. So uh, it's been a long standing one. David Marshall introduced it. Uh, so you're going down the chippy. Uh, do you have haddock or cod for your fish? Phil? Haddock. Haddock. Yeah, haddock. 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 See, I thought cod was a southern thing, but it, it doesn't seem to be. Mm. More flavouring haddock, I think. Just don't mention the skate wings, Martin. No. <laughs> oh yeah, and eels and jelly. No. Right. Um, question fifteen: Do you like a good table in a set of rules, like a penetration table or a casualty table, uh, or are you more modern dice based? Phil, um, I, no, I like, tables. I, yeah, I like tables. Yeah, I, yeah, I like a good table. Um, I like a good table to a point. Yeah, so yeah, with the World War Two, you must have some good, good armor penetration tables kicking around. Well, I, I used to have, and I tried to move away from those kind of rule sets, etc. Though sadly, I got direct, just to say, a small thing. That 1930s imagination thing. We're trying to set the armor classes for the various tanks on the, the rule set. I discovered stuff last night digging out two pounder versus 37 mil penetration tables at 400 meters just to score a point with my colleagues about what the right bloody number should be. I mean, I, that felt a bit hard to score old school to me, but you know, I felt better afterwards after I proved I was right. Yeah, there's a bit of scientific background to it, and you when you can show it on a table, a <laughs> lot better, exactly, a lot better. Uh, right, question 16. Um, Phil, 28 mil is king, yes or no? No. No. What's your preferred scale? Whichever works. Whichever works. Very reasonable answer. Martin? Well, I've got a mixture of 28s, particularly for Sudan, Franco-Prussian, stuff like that, English Civil War, because I think the battles are much smaller. I remember the guy at Old Glory telling me when I said I wanted some AWI in 15, he said, AWI is a 28 mil war. And I went, <laughs> yeah, I kind of get your point. I know where you're coming from. Um, 
But I like big number of polyonic battles, so 15, 18 mil, whatever you want to call it at the moment. So I'm agnostic, I suppose. Agnostic. Did um, did he have a, a deal on his 28 mil AWI? <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> it's always struck with me, though. I thought that's a very good point. You know, small armies, big figures. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree, no, I agree with that. Um, question 17, unpainted miniatures allowed on the table, yes or no? Oh, God, no. It, as I've said, not a chat. I, oh, no, 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 no. no, not at all. Excellent. Unless you're eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We will let you off then. Paint that, you little sod. You're not going out until you've done them. Uh, question 18, we're getting towards the end now. Um, and uh, this is football related. Uh, Bradford City or Leeds United, if you had to choose between the two? So uh, I'm going to say Leeds, I'm afraid, because my best mate is a Leeds supporter. But as yeah. I mentioned, I'm a Gloucestershire boy, so the ball is completely the wrong shape to start off with. Okay? Yes. It's always... Yeah, it's all leg chasing around there, isn't it? Yeah. Is it kick... It's kick and clap in Gloucestershire, isn't it, right? We, as we call it up here. Moving on. <laughs> well, I've got uh, bad experiences of Leeds, so I've got a history with them, so it would definitely be Bradford. Oh, excellent. Well done. Well done. To be fair, I was at Leeds, watching football at Leeds six weeks ago. How was that? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Ellen Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Proper atmosphere. Yeah. Oh. I even had oh. a pie. There you go. Oh. Well, wow, now we're talking. Now we're talking. That's a proper Yorkshire day out, that is. I've, take, I've taken my wife to watch Bradford City. I've said this a couple of times, but I'll say it again. I've taken my wife to watch Bradford City away at Accrington Stanley Ooh, on, that's a, that's on, on both her birthday and our wedding anniversary. Oh, oh, and oh, bought, brave man. Brave man. I, I bought pies one year and then KFC the year after. So No expense spared. She's a lucky woman. I keep telling her. She's a lucky woman. So there we go. Anyway, question 18. Um, Yorkshire or the other place over the hill? Martin. Well, this is a real dilemma for me because I actually <laughs> went to uh, Lancaster University. So oh, I spent yeah. three years there. So yeah. I've got very fond memories of it. But um, mm. I've got great times in Leeds. Great city. Many happy memories at the Queen's Hotel. So, um, um, so I'd say, yeah, Leeds. Uh, definitely Yorkshire. Definitely, definitely Yorkshire. Yorkshire. Excellent. That's what we like to see. Uh, and then final question of the 20. Um, games Workshop, are they the work of the devil? Yes or no? No. No. Can we explain why? Yeah, go on. I think it's an interesting point. It's, people have some quite... Um, I'll check carefully as a man who is salute okay. I mean, yeah, I was just, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think... Okay, I'm not okay. If I got two minutes, I'm not a fan of I'm not a fan of rule sets that insist on a set of figures. For example, a few years ago we had a massive outbreak of Kings of War in our club, and everybody dug out. I mean, even historical people discovered those pile of 1973 goblins who had to lie in the back of their cupboard, and we had a complete hoot. Okay, <laughs> I bought some rubbish. Yeah. And no, I don't yeah. think anybody bought a King of War figure at all. Okay, right, did it? So that's fine. Can we work really into the et etc. So I'm, I'm a bit. I remember that period during the height of Kickstarter, when every week there was a new sci-fi rule set with the figures that go with it came out, and then went broke three seconds later. So I don't like that idea. But let's be clear. You mentioned shops earlier. What's the only thing on the high street that twelve-year-olds going to walk past that might get them into war gaming? So let's not forget that. And yeah. yeah, of course, I get you know, we won't rehearse all the usual stuff about this, about what it costs, etc. etc. But I think as long as you approach it in a sensible manner, you know, I, I you know, they are what they are, aren't they? Okay, right. And um I'd say overall, overall on balance, better than worse. Yeah, no, that's reasonable, reasonable. Uh Martin, you've got a, an opinion on them? I'd say no as well, because I think um the game, well, I admire it as a business. I think from a business model, yeah. it's very successful, and I've got to admire that. But also, there's some of the guys that still work there or did used to work there have been really fundamental in driving the war game, our war game yes. body forward. So I'm very appreciative of that, and I regularly bump, in, bump into shows, a number of those guys who still work there. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting business. And I, I agree, it's an entry into proper war gaming. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's what I like to see. That's what I like to see. Uh, so well done, chaps. Um, Martin, eighty percent. Uh, mm. Phil, seventy-two and a half. <gasps> so not bad at all. Gosh. I was aiming for the bottom. <laughs> not bad at all. Um, so people have got 40% in the past, so uh, <laughs> you've done very well. You've done very, very well. Um, so we'll move on then to uh, the War Games Room 101. And I'm sure listeners know by now, but it's uh, it's kind of our safe space at which you can have a rant about something that you absolutely hate in the, in the hobby. Um, and uh, you're supposed to try and persuade me to put it in, but I always let them in because I... I I, I once wrote down all the things I hate in Wargaming and, and realised that there's quite a few. Uh, but it's not my time. It's not me for me to put things in room 101. Um, so which of you chaps would like to go first with uh, trying to persuade me? Oh, I think I'll go first. I've thought of several, but I think I'm going to focus on, you know, those Wargame opponents who uh, get very overexcited. So you've manoeuvred yourself into a great position. You're mm. eight points up. You've done everything right. You've planned the attack perfectly. You roll double one, they roll double six. And then they scream, yelp, and run around the table, punching the air in delight, where you sit there frustrating. Overreaction. I don't know what you call it. Over, overexcitement. Yes. I just wish they'd say, oh, bad luck, sir. Yeah. But no, overexcited opponents is one of my pet hates. Is that is that a British thing? Do you think that's um, our British character coming out there in, in the... Um, well done, sir. Cricket kind of way, probably, probably. Oh, but I am British, so I'm, I'm proud of it. So yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I just um, I have come across it on a few occasions, and it's very, very uh, frustrating. Is there, and is there, there's, a, there's a level of um, competition there as well as that the, the yes. I don't necessarily enjoy within a game. I, I I'm very much enjoy the you know you know the 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 excitement of it, but not necessarily winning or losing, because you can you can lose in quite a spectacular way sometimes, yeah. which is just as enjoyable as winning. Absolutely, um, absolutely. There's a there's a narrative story to it, yeah. Rather than yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. Like we said earlier about scenarios, there's a scenario that's inherently imbalanced, and you lose, but you go down fighting gloriously. That's quite fun mm, too. Yeah, exactly, isn't it? So. I just don't think when you lose, when you've and yeah. you, get, you don't want your nose rubbed in it by somebody leaping up and down and running around the table punching the areas. Somewhat, mm. it's frustrating. Yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree with you. With you there, Martin. In fact, we were talking about. Um, I think it was Giles, my last guest, um, about is one Lan is is one. I'm never going to say it. Probably that one in in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the British are never going to win. In, in you know the games that he plays, um, and the um, the objective is to get your colours off the table safely and back yeah. to base rather than surviving. Um, yeah, and that's the, those sorts of games I find very very interesting. I'm exactly the same. Yeah. So Phil, have you got one lined up for us? Yeah, um, I, I've mellowed a lot over the ages, so there's have lots. Of things, oh, yeah, yeah, there's lots of things I could happily put in. My note, yeah, but I've just I've become a much more mellow person. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm looking for the comments into this one after this. Anyway, um, and I think in the same situation as Martin described, okay, so you pull off some clever manoeuvre, okay, and it's the same clever manoeuvre that your opponent pulled off 10 minutes beforehand, okay, and you went, fine, and he did it, okay. When you do it, suddenly, let me just check the rule book. <laughs> 20 minutes later of reading out the rules that you just nodded through 10 minutes ago in exactly the same situation, it's five. The modifier is five. I rolled six. You're dead. I let you, That's exactly what happened ten minutes ago in round when I died. No, no, no. Let's take this again. That, you know, you got you've got five minutes of the rule book, and then we move on. Okay, if you can't find it, it's just not true. We'll go with what we just said. Okay, yeah. end of conversation. So that's that worries me up a lot. Yeah, I'd I'd much rather I'd much rather just. Play what we thought it was, and then yeah, exactly if, if you read it in the rules, and in while well, you know in between next week's uh, club night, and come back and go, oh, you remember last week we did that? Oh well, we should have done this. Exactly. Um, yeah. so in games, I played in games with friends of mine where it's gone. Hang on a second, we should be adding plus one all the way through that, and we went okay. Next time, for the moment, we won't add plus one this time, and we'll keep it the yeah. same because the result is therefore the same, isn't it? Everybody? It's all even. Yeah. So. If you play people like that, that's good. If we play people looking around where the plus two is all day, 
No. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely, especially especially if they're trying to find it on a round dice as well. <laughs> definitely banned, definitely. Uh, so we'll finish off this section then with our Desert Island War Game and uh, uh, Radio 4 Desert Island Discs. You get to choose various bits and pieces to take away on your Desert Island, as well as a religious book of your choice and the works of Shakespeare. Um, so uh, first thing you can take is a war game, and it can be absolutely anything, any size, uh, any number of players. It can be a board game. It can be a, could be even be a computer game, as long as it's a war game. Uh, so, Phil, what's your kind of... Desert Island War Game, what would you love to have with you forever? Uh, though I've said about my World War II nerdiness, I yes. think I most enjoyed, because I wrote, wrote the rules myself, um, my 15 mil uh, Plains War. They're pretty to look at. They're quite eccentric, how they yeah. work, all that stuff. So, yeah, if I was forced to do that, I'd be that. That's your mil. kind of... Mm. Yeah. 7th Cavalry and all the rest of it and, and, and lots of lots of uh, cool looking uh, Plains Indians Oh fantastic, is that because it's your game? Is, is that yeah, the... I think well, I just, uh, it, it's, they're not all, they're not all grey Yeah you know, uh, you know my, a lot of my 1940s a lot of grey obviously uh, <laughs> yeah. Grey and khaki Grey and grey and khaki, so, that's, but, so yeah if I've got to sit with this thing forever Okay, and also of course it does like, and, and rewrite the asymmetrical rules about the role of Red Cloud in his morale boosting yeah. situation as well. Of course, it'd be great. Yeah, no, I like it. I like it, Martin. What would your? Um, can I steal somebody else's figures? <laughs> you must... No, yeah, of course you can. Just don't well, tell them. I haven't got any twenty-eight mil Napoleonic, so I think some of Mark Frith's excellent connoisseur foremost figures, you know, it's like conversions by Doug Mason. You know those units. I just I love them. I I would I I crave them. So if the, I could one army, I'd all series of arms. I take away it'd be uh, some of Mark's Napoleonics. Yeah, um, Doug Mason was is one of those people, isn't he? That just brings um, metal to life. The yes. way that he um, not just paints a figure, that he builds a unit. Um, something I spoke to Pete Morby about in some detail. Um, how when he's making he's he's sculpting figures he's not just sculpting the figure he's sculpting the figure to fit in a unit of figures that looks oh, wow. in a okay. certain way yeah. Yeah. um and and that's how doug mason's always done his figures and i think it's fantastic i really it do. fantastic yeah when you say a religious book presumably you mean featherstone or wargaming don't you not the bible presumably that's the religious book we're gonna take with us yes, of, course. Religious book. of course <laughs> that's the one. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's book time now, actually. So uh, now you've snuck another book in. Um, <laughs> what would be the what? What should go? What's your a book that you would like to take? Oh, oh! Uh, <laughs> this man's thinking of his collection here. So I, I don't. Oh, oh, that's really tricky. Really tricky. Um, uh, oh, now you, oh, you're going to have to edit a lot of ones out of this one, okay? Because I'm umming a lot, and I have to think. Um, I, I. I think it would be a history book rather than a war gaming book. A yeah. history book that would inspire me to think about something war gamey. Yeah. And I think, good question. I, I'm really struggling, actually. I'm really struggling to pick one. I've got loads in my head. Has Martin got to, one? Go to Martin, has he got one? Yes. Uh, right, just something like I've got a, a, a five volume set or seven volume set. You know, you, have you ever read Phipps and the Wars of the French Revolution? So I, I take know, that. I Oh, uh, it's it follows the marshals, or as they were, through various stages of the Revolutionary Wars. Um, it is a turgid, difficult read. Uh, makes um, some other authors it look very easy to read, but there's a hell of a lot of detail there about very, very obscure battles, which I love designing scenarios for. So, um, yeah, the five volume set of Phipps, if I can take that, that would be good. Yeah. Wars of the French Revolution. Brilliant. I, I thought with that actually. So, um, Lurking in my brain is the whole great game, you know, the kind of Indian, Russians compete things. Um, I read a couple of books recently. Uh, Peter Hopkirk does this whole thing, trespasses on this, all that stuff. And actually, I played a, I played a board game the other day of it with a, a, a mate of my dad's. Uh, it was good fun. But I feel that kind of daring do and all that stuff and, and, and sneaking around the pool and all that mm. stuff, I think, will be really interesting read and will inspire all sorts of gamey thoughts. 
Excellent, excellent choice. And, and finally, a single war games unit. It can be yours. It can be anybody else's. Um, something that you would love to own and take with you. Well, I think if we can guess what mine is already, because Mark Frith, bless him, keeps putting these bloody pictures up on Facebook of Doug Mason's work of. And I saw some Austrian Newlands the other day, and I thought, oh, they just look amazing. Every yeah. figure was just slightly different, and. Um, Sadly, that really floats my vote. My vote. I really, you know, love that sort of thing. So yes, I, I love that unit. I'd love to own that. Brilliant. Um, oddly, uh, my ten mil French charbies that I painted entirely myself Ooh. in in the in the classic massively complicated French camouflage. They included me getting a sharpie pen out to do the black lines Ooh. and then very Ooh. carefully spraying them from about eight foot away with varnish. And getting more varnish on them so they wouldn't rub off, okay, which failed a couple of times. And just because I actually painted them, they look quite decent and I, I'll play with them a lot. That's my unit. William, excellent choice. Excellent choice. Right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a minute and uh, we'll talk about Salute. Okay, so we're, we're on to our big topic and. Uh, We've uh, we've got to know the guys a little bit now. Um, we know we know Phil and Martin's tastes and uh, they're what they're into, etc. Uh, so uh, what we're going to talk about now, and we we haven't had anyone on the show before who um, has organised a game. So there's lots of little avenues that we can go down and, and chat about uh, with this. Um, so at the start of the show, I kind of mentioned Sloop, big game in London, big gaming show a war game show in the london area so there's there's a little bit on you on your on the website so what's kind of a potted history of salute then when did it start and how did it get to where we are now okay so i think it started as i said well the club started in 71 i think the first show was something like 74 something like that um and it started in 72 72 i stand corrected 72 and um it sort of Basically, one of the things that kept it growing was more and people, more and more people attended. What we started in, you know, in the Oval, then we moved to Chelsea Town Hall, which is a fantastic venue. Then we moved to Kensington. Then we moved to Olympia. Part of the reason for that was the show was growing more and more successful, and um, it was uncomfortable. And fire officers were unhappy about the number of people. And the, the biggest driver of XL, where we've been for about 14 years, did we say? Yeah, 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 14 years. years right, yeah. Is um, it can accommodate the number of people, which is close to five to six thousand visitors, plus a thousand people inside. And so, is it an ideal venue? Is the lighting great? Is the floor hard? These, these are all things we all know. Um, but trying to find a venue that can accommodate that number of people is a major problem, made a headache for us. So, uh, Excel fits that. I mean, if it grew any further, I don't know what we'd do, but... Um... I think we've, we've often... I, I've been on the committee with this probably more than Martin, I think. I mean, every so often we go... Every so often we go, two days, no, bigger. No, just because two days is two days, and that's a whole different ball game. Bigger means you've got to try and do the setup in the same amount of time and, and all that kind of stuff. It just gets really interesting. You know, um, you can make a constitution to go smaller, and then I'd be making a lot of disappointed people. So it's 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 kind of in balance at the moment in scale, and I'm just a small fact. I mean, I think we get besides so the guys who put out the furniture, the event height, all the tables and bits we hire, they bring five. Uh, there's at least one, two artics and three seven colours, right, coming to the hall, and then you can imagine the likes of Wayland and you know Wall of Gate, those big square stands you see on the end. Okay, they are bringing in a couple of seven ton trucks. Now, you ain't going to do that in Kingston Town Hall. You know what I mean? There are very few places where you can do that, where you can roll this onto the floor and they, you know, roll out their stuff on the back. So there is a, there is a bit of a kind of, you know, it's, it's go big or go home. And we said, go big or go home. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, the, the, the current venue obviously is, is all, is, is one hall, everything together. Whereas the other venues have had different floors or, um, different, uh, parts to them um 
how does it how do you how have you felt about those the change from that to the the kind of enormous dome has it lost any of its feeling i remember kensington town all kind of had a a vibe to it that was different yeah, yeah. i mean people are, nostalgia is a great thing okay it's great mm. but uh do you think about one uh people lugging things up and downstairs Ooh. uh it all got a bit hot and sweaty and smelly right didn't it? Okay. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? and again i refer to the fact that there's some seven ton trucks to be removed into the situation as well so that gets a bit messy I agree. It, it, let's say it is a barn. Everybody says it's a barn, but it is a barn that works. What you want to try and do here, um, yeah. I, I, I'd love to have a lower ceiling and more lights and you know carpet and run up the coffee machine, especially the coffee machine, no tea, yeah. Yeah. No, and, all that stuff, and all that stuff. But you know, it, we're a bunch of volunteers. You know, mm. it, it runs. It runs on a cycle and. It's the it's it's the least worst way of doing something for this scale, I think. Uh, yeah. The other thing about dividing games, of course, is we have lots of stands, trader stands, who put on games. So they have my biggest jigsaw problem is getting a game in a row, game row, somewhere adjacent to the stand where they want it, and then fitting all the other. <laughs> so that's a bit yeah. of fun. So, yeah. so um, again, I I love to. I'd love to have a little game lounge. That's the but it won't. Mm. It won't function. I'm with you. I remember Kensington very, very fondly. And when I think yeah. about it, I get, you know, wow, it's, but it's nostalgia. When you think about it, that was pre-internet. Yes, and you, know, yeah. you go there and suddenly see something you've never seen before. And they've got these new figures. And nowadays that's been changed. And Salute has had to change. And the team have done a great job of changing and moving it to reflect the new internet age and the way people shop and the way people buy. Um, I'm, I'm literally, this is my first year as president. Before that, I was never even on the committee. So I'm a, I'm a bit of a virgin when it comes to salute. I've worked many, many salutes, but I've not been involved in the organisation at all. Some would say I'm not now. <laughs> <laughs> Just to point out, Emily, so Marty will be judging the games you have at salute, everybody. So start your lobbying now if you wish to get a game prize. I'm just saying, right? Martin Gain at Warlords. He's the guy who stopped bribing now for your prize, okay? Yeah, if you could put my bank account details at the end, that would be quite useful. No, that's no, no problems at all. No problems at all. We like a good bribe on this show. Um, if you had if you had a mission statement for Salute, if there's a goal of the show, is it, what what are, what are you trying to do for... Okay, there's a public one. Okay. There's a club by the public, right? Okay. So, public, you know, our, our constitution says the job of the club is allowed to play war games, but also promote war gaming and push war gaming out. Okay. So, Sloot is part of that. The origins of Sloot is as much that, you know, the originators of our club and subsequent generations were very strong on it's about promoting war gaming and Sloot is a way of promoting war gaming. I mean, it used to be called the Club Open Day, technically speaking. Nice. Yeah. Okay. But so, anyway, that's. So it has grown in some, in some, into a beast, but it's still about that and giving people access to that. From a club point of view, you know, I mean, we all love running it, and every so often there's, a, you know, there's debates about, you know, are we a club or do we want to salute? I mean, that happens all the time. Every so often you might imagine. <laughs> yeah. and, and but as it happens, we've got a thriving club. Um, so public objective is about allowing people to see amazing war games. It's allowing trades of all shapes and sizes to plug into a massive thing. We might come back to this. The amount of business to business that goes on in SLU, I think, is quite surprising. We don't really register that, but this year we're trying to help that a bit in various ways. I imagine it's quite a lot of that, you know, sculptors and people get together with a cup of coffee. So as a as a place where people do business to each other and mm. contact is quite strong. And from a club point of view, it is, you know, make enough to keep it going over and make enough to keep the fun pay for the hall, pay for the sting, right? Because our members are volunteers. But if you work a shift at a, a thing, you get um, money for your membership. So most people work Sloot and play at the club free. And Sloot allows us to do that. So that's the kind of club objective is just keep it stable, keep it ticking over. There are no gold dice in our cupboards, everybody, to be clear. Okay? Well, we are just, we just, <laughs> we've, just got, we've just got standard scenery and plastic boxes like everybody else, okay? Um, and all that, you know what I mean? So that is two objects. One is public pushing the game. The other one is let's just keep it going and, and maintain a, a club. I think increasingly it's become about a celebration of the hobby. Yeah. You know, we want to celebrate the hobby. And it's a great venue, particularly for people who live in the air, live nearby, live in the southeast, to come together and meet mates. And they only see them at Salute. You know, yeah. it's a great meeting place. And um, 
you know, we ask game people to bring their games if they can, but, you know, it, it, we accept it's very difficult, but it is a great venue for people to get together, meet up, talk about the hobby, have a few pints down by the, by the water, and um, really just celebrate what a great hobby and what a fantastic hobby is for everyone. Everyone's engaged in it. Everyone enjoys it. And this is just a, a vehicle to enable that to happen. So when, when you did come to this venue that you're at now, um, what was the what was the kind of things that ticked the boxes for you to move from? It was at, it was at Excel you were at and you've, you've now moved. Olympia, yeah, we're at Olympia before. Uh, Olymp Olympia, sorry, yes. Yeah. I think before my time on the committee, I think before time my time on the committee. So I mean, I think if I as I understand it, it's just accessibility, scale, cost issue. I mean, just a just a standard thing for any reason why you know, yeah. And just so I said, it's just before you go, make it work, okay, as a as a functioning thing for a big show run by a bunch of volunteers. Yeah, I think it's. A I think year one Olympia was on one floor, and by year five we were on three floors. You know, you can imagine taking your game up three flights of stairs with no entry and ability to get there. It, it wasn't going to last. This, the advantage of this venue, as Phil's already said, you know, I've worked on the transport side with them for ages. And you, you get these huge lorries turning up and unloading. And we've got to do that and turn it all around within a couple of hours. It's, uh, it's an impressive feat. But also, games guys, their big games can drive their car in, remember, and set their game out and boot the car. Which again is not to be underestimated when people are carrying twenty-eight mil lead buckets around. Okay, right? Of, you know, I'm not sure. I see a lot of suspensions bending quite heavily when in the hall sometimes. Okay, as they unload. <laughs> Very true, and I think um, as well. Um, and this isn't a disrespect to salute this, but the people there are used to running things like this and organising and getting loads of people in. And you know, when when I came down to salute last year, there were trade fairs on, there was business conventions, you know, all in different halls, all the same size or uh, as salute. So it, there's buckets of stuff going on at the same time. Yes and no, but remember, yeah. <laughs> once you get okay, just be coming clear. Once you get past the security car, the front door, it's us, right? Yeah. Excel basically give me a big square space. And then proceed to charge me X grand for every time I want something different done to it. Okay, <laughs> that's what they do, right? Every so I, I we start with a completely blank space and a bunch of walls, and they open the door at a certain time, and the rest of it is us. Cheers. <laughs> so, Cheers. And when you say about experience of organising it, no, I mean exactly. We hand over the money, and they go fill your boots, right? Is what they do. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be clear about this. <laughs> and it's driven by about. Five, ten people in the South London Wars really drive, salute, make it happen. And then there's an army of maybe 25, there's no more than that, gamers from the club who give up their time from 7 o'clock in the morning yeah. on Saturday right the way through to sometimes 7 o'clock at night. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, and their family and friends come along too. Yeah. We get a lot of family and friends come along to help out on the day as well, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. I mean, so it's been complete amateur, complete volunteers. That's what yeah. I don't think people quite realise the level of commitment that's given to make sure that everyone has a great day. Yeah. And um, that's very much how, how we do things in Leeds as well. It's uh, the, the fiasco show has always been a club show. Um, it's always been one where members have helped, you know, set tables up and, and move stuff around and, and take money on the door and all that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, do you, do you kind of, um, how, so you said about 10 people organize it during the year. Is that right? And, and do they have, do you know, do you have a, a trade person, a game person? How does it kind of set so, the rules out? So we've, we've got a club committee, okay? And the mm. club committee overlaps with people in the salute. So, you know, we have a president, a chairman, and a treasurer, and a membership secretary, and, you know, a games organiser, and the salute lead, that's me, okay? And then we have, you know, salute assistance, salute person. And generally, you know, we divide the jobs up. So, you know, uh, my capital assistant, Peter, is basically been talking to traders, booking me in with our new system, online system. We, this year is the first time we've gone completely online booking oh, as opposed to paper. So he's helped set that up and, you know, chasing up invoices and all that kind of stuff. So that, and yeah, so we divide the jobs between us. We've got a hyperactive, you know, I tend to lead the kind of just the overall project management. There's got to be a project management applied to this. Um, Pointing and shouting. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, what I do. that's all I do apparently is point and show. I was actually doing real work, apparently. And then, of course, then we've got a really, um, I mean, the committee, yeah, we have technically roles, but the committee has worked very much as one. If something needs doing, we've found somebody to do it, okay? Largely speaking. Obviously, the treasurer, treasurer job is a treasurer job, but even so, other things are happening. And I'll just be a shout out to, like I said, the, the newer, younger members, especially people like Alex and John, and, and also, you know, who've been driving the PRO agenda and the new panels, like so public relations stuff, and really making the um, socials fly and, and in a new environment. And the, the panel, the new stage and panel thing we've been doing, that kind of stuff. So, mm. really new ideas, really pushing it. So, it's a real team effort. I think it's a real team effort. Team I mean, team you know, effort. the Constitution says you will do that for it. The reality is, we make it, we do what you do to make it work. Yeah. Uh, I kind of mentioned it at the start of the, in the introduction, and um, I'm aware that the, the Wally model train show, which was at the NAC, which is one of the biggest model railway exhibitions in the UK, going on for years and years, and the members have said, we're too old, we can't do it anymore, uh, and, and that's it. So are you... Are you I think we, I think you are from what we've been chatting about with the with the membership um, of getting these new people in. You're clearly still running it. You're still still able to do it. Can you see people taking over those roles as time goes by and keeping the show going? Yeah, and I think that's what we've done. I mean, the way part of the PR machine we've got in place now is is relatively new because we accept to realise we need to attract a younger demographic for one of a marketing term because. You know the the older members are dying out to be to be blunt, <laughs> and um, we need we need new people to keep salute going. And um, yeah. look, the guys who did salute before did a great job, uh, absolutely fantastic. But the danger was if we didn't change, it, it was going to get stale because people were saying, "Oh, it's just salutes the same." So the introductions of the panels last year was very successful, and we've got a great lineup this year. And we're thinking, well, this is good. This will attract a different audience, hopefully retaining um, the older play, the old gamers we've already had, but bring in some number of new members as well. And the market, you know, as, a, uh, as Phil says, we've not quite given free reign, but the, the younger members have said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And uh, we said, yeah, let, let's let's try it. You know what? If, if the panel was a disastrous failure, we'd go, OK, we tried something new and it didn't work. And not all our ideas work, but... We tried something new. We think it's successful. We're going to keep plugging away, keep trying to keep it live and keep it vibrant. Mm. Well, I'm going to going to move on now and talk about different aspects of the of, of the of the show itself and and the features, etc. Is, is one of the ones that we're going to talk about and new ideas. Um, but the first one I want to, want to talk about is trade. Lots of traders come to salute, and it was always kind of traditionally the. Um, the launch pad for many new products, etc. Um, so, roughly, how much trade do you have? Do you, do you know the? So it's about, well, okay, I'll say one hundred and thirty. But of course, obviously, there's people with multiple names and different cuts. But it's about I'll say about one hundred and thirty because obviously it's still changing. There are people coming in late, and there are people yeah. even even this late stage. But generally, about one hundred and thirty. You know. On the, on past years, we've had 140, but it depends what size. Remember, we, we, we have people who've got a one six foot wide table, and then we've got at the other end of the scale, Wayland, and they're four seven yeah, dinners. Massive, right? yeah. So there's a huge range. Interestingly, this year I worked out we've got 32 first timer traders at the show, yeah, which is really interesting. I thought about doing it. Mm. Um, interestingly, I've only got like I think, to be fair, three, only three kind of 3D print design house types. That is up from, that is up from one last year, of course. And we've got that long conversation about that future. I think we've this year come back, we've got a big return of our European friends. And by I mean European, some of our friends are coming from Lithuania <laughs> and Poland, uh Brazil. Um and I think I've got I think I'm into eight or nine of those of the European traders coming back in Spanish uh latvians italians yeah 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 so yeah a big a real mix of coming back in again from you know obviously the reason we'll discuss here downcline that kind of thing um so yeah it's i think that's the kind of scale we're talking about but like i said there's some people with six footers and some people with huge square footage can i can i just add we don't say no to anyone no. so there's a number of 
number of traders that I've spoken to at shows that we really love to be at salute. Mm. You said, no, I don't want to do it, you know, which is fine. That's not a problem. But I often members of the, the gamers that come to salute say to me, but well, why is an X trader here? And I say, because they, they don't want to be, which is fine. That's their choice. It's not a, you know, yeah. I'm with, but we don't turn people down. I know there are some other, we're very well known uh, shows that are literally a closed shop. You can't get into it, even if you wanted to, but we're trying to encourage new people every year because yeah. it brings in, you know, it changes. It brings that variety that people are looking for. And also with the number of traders we've got, there's always going to be turnover anyway. If you're, if you're already showing 30 traders, the turnover is going to be 10% is three. With 150, 140 traders, 10% is a lot of traders every year. You know, you know what I mean? So I think there's that. Yeah, we did, we did want to generally, I mean, the first come first serve, but obviously people who know about the show will tell us we're definitely coming back with all our 35 square foot of feet, thank you very much, for which okay. we're very grateful. Let's not be serious about this, but the yeah. regulars. But equally, there's always room for some of the extra to squeeze in, and we spend, I spend, a lot of time with the old jigsaw puzzle out, trying to squeeze in that last little trader. Mm. Okay, cool, can just turn up? Yeah, please, absolutely. And I'm not talking about the money, I'm talking about, obviously, we don't turn, they're paying us, so we love that too. But also, if I could squeeze in another three six foot traders, I'd do that over another 30 footer, to be frank. Mm. I mean, you know, Committees about to shoot me for saying about money, but you don't. I mean, but you know, that's the, not literally that. But I'd rather try and squeeze another new trader to try and get out in some way and accommodate them as much as possible. Yeah, it's it's it, that's it. Yeah, it just it's here. And one of the things I was kind of go going to come to is is that attempt to get new people in and an attempt to show off new trade because many, well, not many, but some of the the larger, older, more established traders have decided post COVID to not go back into the show circuit to the level that they were, um, and that will give an opportunity to those newer traders, won't it? Yeah. I, th I think there's a whole, um, what they're missing is maybe the marketing angle that people go to a show, they see them there and they see some figures that they've not seen before and thought, oh, they're really nice. I will go and buy those in six months time or so. Yeah. So I get why traders just look at the bottom line and say, I don't sell enough to justify or it's too much of a hassle or whatever. I understand that, but that marketing angle is really important, I think. Yeah, this, uh, this, uh... The, the traders I've spoken to, uh, a bit of market research and everything, um, they all seem to do good business at Salute. Nobody nobody walks away from Salute without a pocket full of change. Um, you, you, you know, you're selling stuff, you're busy all the time. You know, I've, I've tried to go to some stands and not been able to get near them because there's been, you know, they've been doing so much business, which is a, an absolute positive for anyone who is selling stuff there. Amazingly, when I ask them how they did, they go, oh, not too bad, Phil. I can't, I don't understand why they always just say, me, oh, it's okay. It's not great. Okay. It's okay. You know, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, we, we have that fiasco as well. You know, you've seen like people handing massive wads of 20s out and these, these two guys turn up with shotguns to take the, <laughs> escort the trader out with his cash box. Oh, it's been dreadful. It's been dreadful. Worst one I've had. Worst one. But yeah, yeah. That, that, that's trade. That's traders for you. Um, and uh, I think you kind of said as well that it's um, the ease of the venue for traders as well is is a bit of a plus point because you can get your vehicles in. You know, we we we're at the Royal Armouries, which is no, you know, it's not a, a sports hall or a club sort of venue or anything like that. But everyone's got to trolley the stuff back and forward. So being able to get vehicles in must. Um, a, allow you to have bigger stands and attract people like Wayland, like you say. Yeah, it just makes it easy to move around, which is, you know, everyone, as, as gamers are getting older, so a trade is getting older. And if you can help them move stuff around, we've got volunteers to help them and guide them. That all makes the whole process easy. We want it to be as easy as possible. I bought one of them builder's trolleys, you know, the ones that they carry loads of bricks around. Best 75 quid I've ever spent. I could get my game in, two or three runs on my big trolley. Oh magic i feel i feel like i'm a working man as well with the builders trolley <laughs> so that, that's um oh is it still going yeah, no, yeah. Still going. it occasionally does this on the last section it just gets a bit um 
Wobbly. Full. Mostly, mostly because I, I, it's the free version because I'm from Yorkshire. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, moving on then to games. How do you choose who comes or which games? Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the yeah. mythology, right? There's, there's a kind of, in the same way. Why didn't you invite so and so trader? We don't invite people. They want to turn up. I will try and fit him in. Okay. Uh, or. There's the occasional, we've had, in the past, we've had the occasional, my, my psychic ball has failed to register that somebody assumed they were coming to salute. That's been a quite a good experience when I started doing this job. Uh, I all come to salute. Okay. For the last nine months, we put up everything we could say, okay, do your booking. I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm not psychic. So about that, I mean, you know, fair enough, people are busy and they're noticing, but it's hard to, I think it's be hard to miss that salute's on by a certain date, I hope. I hope we have noticed that. You know, our PR's not working. Games, same games. Um, traders often want our little game space to demonstrate their latest thing. And this year, you know, I know for a fact we've got at least three or four kind of launches going on, which I won't say out loud, uh, for various people. And their games tables going to have those things on them. So that, that takes a bit of space when traders do that. And then after that, it's if you want to put on a game at Sloot, fill the booking form in and we'll see what we can do. Mm. I mean, and, and I, I said, I spend most of my time juggling the Matrix map of people to try and get as many games in as I possibly can in the space before the fire officer Excel tells me off. Okay. Literally that'll do it. So again, we don't Martin goes around, that's Martin no, said. I go around the show oh. circuit begging people, literally mm. begging, I love the look of this game. And it can be a small game, a big game. I really love it. Will you bring it to Saloon? <clears throat> yeah. Big clubs, small clubs, um, you know, and sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not, but mm. um it's yeah, we're we're open. We want people to bring games, but it's a challenge. Now, obviously, obviously, occasionally some people might go, "Hang on, why are you betting games? You got the best possible game you get." Okay, and that, again, well, frankly, my life's too short to go and check out every single game. And or, or even anybody, I mean, Martin does reverse that. Goes, "God, your game's amazing. It'd be great. I mean, salute." Yeah. Equally, but nobody, but generally, nobody tends to turn up at salute with with a bit of carpet tile and two plastic tanks because he's just no. it's, 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 it's not being funny. You yeah. know what I mean? You're not going to yeah. make all the effort of driving down to London or even getting to London from Surrey or Essex and then do something that goes, what's that then? Okay. Um, so I think people are always for shows anyway, these days go the extra mile. I mean, even though, even though kind of very participation game that is on the face of it, very simple is really welcome because it's participation game, especially, I mean, I, I mean, one of the games we gave a couple of years ago, we gave a, a, a prize to was a fairly simple uh, six mil uh, custer color game. Game, mm. but the number of kids are running around it playing with it just gazillions. Oh, okay? fantastic! And just yeah. like, right, click, this is right. You're participating. You've got the white crowd. Have a have a prize. Um, so I think, yeah. So I think you know, uh, try again. Book in. Have a go. It looks like, it. and I think um we don't we don't vet um and i don't think we should frankly it's about mm. all types of all comers and and that's how you get a more frankly that's how you get a more slightly more bizarre mix yeah. of games yeah. really. you, know, ups, you know there's some uh, i'll still remember let's face it i'll give a shout out to the guys at bexley still one of the most remembered and bizarrest games in the history is salute zombie game okay <laughs> which was about five years ago they set a little yeah. miniature thing of the hall and your job as a war game was to go around and collect your pre-orders from the stands while dodging the zombie <laughs> hordes. And it was genius. It was okay, right? and, and, and so there's, but that's the example. You just let people do stuff, great stuff will turn up, okay, right? From massive games to really clever small things that work. And we've got people coming. We've got people from all over Europe coming to put games on. Yeah. We've even got people, I know there's a guy's coming down from Inverness, the Edinburgh War oh, Games cool. Club are coming. So, you know, we do attract a wide, Choice of people. I, we've got some weird guy from Yorkshire coming down, haven't we, yeah, Martin? With yeah. some unbelievable. I don't, yeah. I, I, some guy, I don't know who he is, really. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 He wanted a lot of space. He wanted a lot of space. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Really annoyed. I have to yeah. fit him in somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, did, I, I did ask for that about a space, expecting you to say, fuck off. <laughs> it's all right, you're next to the toilet. It's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's very true. I think I'm near the stage, aren't I? I'm going to have to listen to, I'm going to, to, listen to Rich Clark. Chuntering on about somewhere. You're in the you're in the central location between the paint competition and the stage. Okay, you are in you're in the heart of the show. Come on. 
Will I be able to see my 96 figure pipe block in the painting? Case? <laughs> you break it in two, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even break it in two. It's still too big. Right, anyway, I've said I'd not rant any more about it. I'm going to calm down now. Uh, <laughs> so is 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 there a i know i know you've said that, that you know you're not picking and, picking and choosing but do you, do you try and get a mix of demo and participation games um i know yeah. you know hammerhead is all participation whereas some shows are mostly all demo so is it what's your you know ideal mix if you could have one again again we don't enforce that in any way mm. But we do have separate prizes for you know best games, best participation games. So it kind of applies to that. Um, again, we end up with ninety odd separate games, some of them more than one table. So kind of by default, you get a good mix of games. <laughs> yeah. Participation demo. I think I I, I don't know, I can't prove this. Mm. I would say increasing participation games because people have worked out it's more fun. And let's face it. Even the non-participation games that are big beasts end up being participation games because people end up spending talking all the time and not any moving actually figures. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. but that's the way it is. But then there's, there's some amazing pop. So it sort of happens by osmosis and accident, and that's great, I think. And again, it's, it's, if you stop trying to control these things too much, you'll end up producing fake barriers and limit uh, innovation, and limit people's thought processes. So I, I a, I haven't got, we haven't got time and space to start doing vetting games that way and uh, i think by default we get quite a few yeah, uh, think, yeah. we're just grateful for people coming you know yeah. bring games i mean it's they're showcasing what they're doing and it's uh it's brilliant you know engages mm -hmm. with the public you know the feedback the stories you hear countless times are i was at salute you know i was there four hours and i came back and two days later i saw something on the blog about a game i didn't even notice so i'm trying to stress to people that they should pace themselves have a break <laughs> yeah. Go away, have a beer at lunchtime and come back again because it's so much easier. You mentioned the zombie game. That one stuck out in your memory. What, what are some of the other sort of salute classics? Oh, that's that hard. I, I shouldn't have really name checked that one because that's unfair. On the hundred, let's face it, hundreds of games a year and yeah. thousands of the games the last year I've been going. So it seems really unfair. This one will annoy some people. This will annoy some people. Jersey Privateers did. Uh, Flash Gordon in Lego. Okay, they had a massive. It was, it was it was all Lego. They built it a big tower. Even yeah. the dice you put the Lego dice in a little drawer and it popped out the bottom. And they had all the episodes of the classic Flash Gordon God the Live movie in episodes around this big block. It was unbelievable. Okay, and of course, you imagine we gave a prize and people went. It was Lego. <laughs> no, it was a game. Loads of people were playing it. It was complete genius. Why would you not give it a prize? Okay, so I remember that one. Yeah. Uh, Martin, got a few? <clears throat> well, I can mention those, but I, I think the danger is if I mention one, I'll do yeah. something else. But you know, the games put on by, um, you know, what's his name, Ian, uh, the great 40 millimeter games that were put on. Ian Smith, late oh, great yeah. Ian Smith. Yeah. 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 He put on some brilliant games. Bill Gaskins put on some great games. I, I'm saying this is a hardened historical gamer those are the ones that i remember now i've still got pictures of but there are so many and i think um the danger is you wander around in a bit of a daze and some of the smaller games you you tend to walk straight by i've got some really fascinating and interesting characteristics in them and rules yeah. you can learn so much by engaging and i just encourage everyone to talk to people who are putting on games because you can i've always learned something new from every mm. game you can learn something always yeah, I, I I found that certainly um, the last when I came last year um, was that I'd missed a number of games and I was there all day, obviously talking to people because that's what I do. Um, but um, you know, Simon Miller's game really stuck out with yeah, yeah, thousands of, uh, of, and then like you were saying there, Marty. Sometimes that smaller game, I saw a I saw a couple of really really nice ones that. I would have walked past unless somebody drew my attention to it and i kind of you need to go in and, and and look to get that picture that you would get in a photograph yes. um whereas the you know the huge tables in the large zone and stuff like that were all fantastic it was it was a great day out like i say if you go to a show and you miss some tables um my good friend um alex southern that usually goes around and videos them all yeah yeah so i i, I rely on him 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, yeah, we all do. Yeah, yeah, we all do. I mean, it's, I mean, of course, and increasingly, I mean, the podcasting thing has grown immensely. So, mm. um, yeah, we, we offer a room for podcasters now and to actually recharge their gear and stuff. And, and yeah, there will be more than one video wander around. Uh, I think it would be great. So I keep I keep dodging them because they keep wanting to talk to me, so I try to avoid them. To be clear, I never see any games. Okay? <laughs> yeah. I never see any games. It, it, like, last year, last year is the first year I actually ran this. I led with them, as opposed to I helped out in the past. This last year was the first year I ran it for real. And this is my second year. Last year I didn't see anything, not a thing. I think I bought one can of spray paint the entire day, and that was it. Yeah, it, it, it happens. I I've got a trick now when we do fiasco. I set the table, I get there really early, set the table up, and then at quarter past nine, I run around the traders and buy everything that I want. Uh, I can't remember who it was last year, but I made them get their little cash, their little um, card machine out and switch it on so I could buy something. <laughs> so I'm not going to come back. I'm not going to get a chance to come back the rest of the day. It's either now or never. Yeah. And of course, they, they got it out, ready to go, ready to go. Um, so, if you were um, just finally on the on the kind of the games thing, how do people get games on then? If they want to come to the show, uh, you mentioned a booking form. What, what's kind of how they so want to get involved? This year, this year yeah. we, had, we had we had a single point booking form. Yeah, you went and go. I'm a trader or a gamer, and they and it changed the options and said how big a table do you want. Describe your game. That's it. I mean, you know. Um, how would they do that through a website through the saloon that's what I think so, so okay so obviously we're we are full bar hot news everybody hot news i think i'll probably have a six by five game space available so you want to put the game in salute give us a shout via the website everybody there's an offer special offer you heard it here first or possibly last um i just remember that somebody's just changed their mind or something so we get better that next year if I'm stupid enough to get voted on again and stupid enough to run this show again, <laughs> uh, we'll open a form which will be massively advertised on the, on the website and on our Facebook and our socials, everybody, to start going, I'd like to win a game. Absolute. I mean, and obviously people go, God, it's July or August and it's going to be April. We don't quite know. We, we're reasonably flexible at people going, I want to put the game of some description. It'll be kind of this. I'm not quite sure yet. We're, we're rolling that for a while. We're not charging anybody, and that's that's fine, you know. So we don't charge for games. It's completely clear, already. they all free access. So you know, even if people go, oh, I'm not sure I can round up five people by April next, you know, sure. put a marker down. And obviously, if you go quiet until October, come October, I might probably put my foot down and going, Are you really coming? Yeah. But other than that, you know, keep your eyes open in July, August next year, and there'll be stuff around to put your booking form on. Excellent, excellent news. Um, so we'll move on then, and we'll talk kind of a bullet point talk around features that you've added and things that you've think thought about and you know all the what we were talking about earlier on of keeping the shows going and keeping them interesting uh and you know stealing from other shows or wherever you get your eyes your ideas from don't really mind um and so the, one of the things that you brought in i think last year was the first year was the talks and the um the the area so how did that go? What were your kind of positives and your feedback from that? Well, you, the one thing we're, I think we're very good at, we're very good at listening. So we read mm. all the blogs, we read all the feedback, and we take that away. Even the little details that, you know, some things are very, very repetitive, but, you know, I've bent Phil's ear about there's never enough chairs. You know, we've got more chairs this year. But, oh, more chairs. Um, in previous years, I've been to both Cold Wars and Historicon, uh, obviously, I go to the UK shows, but there's always ideas you can take from them. And they have quite a few talks. Um, I wasn't the originator. This came from Phil and his team. But the talks just seems a way of some, doing something a bit different. Let's try different. Let's see if people like them. And from the feedback we got was that, yeah, they're very good. Um, could we do it better? Yeah, of course. Did things go wrong? Of course. But we've learned a lot from those. And I think we've perfected them. We've got a better sound system. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and. Um, really improved panels and, and we're finding that people want to come on the panels and talk about things which is is great it's a great way with engaging with the you know the greater gaming public which is fantastic yeah i, I think it came out quite by accident i mean uh, let's be clear we had we had a big we had you know post we all you know all showed a rough time in covid right and we had a rough yeah. time during covid well, let's be clear let's just move on past that okay it was yeah. you know it, it was damn hard i was on the committee it was challenging let's be clear about this and we came out of it and 
last year was a real proper bounce back, but it was about, you know, largely a largely new committee, you know, um, younger people. We were, you know, you can imagine we were slightly nervous about what we were going to imagine, like you know, about shows and rail shows. You think mm. back, did, did we know if a thousand people were going to turn up or four thousand people were going to turn up? Yeah. As it turned out, nearly six thousand people turned up. Bless them all. Thank you all for coming. And, and it, it almost it almost surprised us. And some of the things that went wrong with life went, we had a thousand people more yeah, we thought. than we thought. We, or even two thousand. <laughs> we thought, you know. So so that, that's one thing. So let's be clear about that. And this year we got right. Let's be ready for this. The stage area was a bit of a kind of last minute thought process to fill in. We uh, we used to have a big. We have quite a big display area one time, and mm. either lots of chairs and or like a big tank or some airplanes. And we had some airplanes. When I came to draw, draw the map, we had this big space, and we thought we could fit the chairs or traders. How about? And this was literally a stage of it in there, and that was literally the conversation. Let's, let's try a stage. Let's try a stage and do some talks off it. And that was literally the thought process. <laughs> it was we got a space. I've been muttering about adding value in some talks. Let's try it. And we didn't have the white speakers. This year we've got a better sound system. Hopefully we re relayed it out a bit more, a bit more crowd control, better seats, more seats everywhere. If you have to hear. Uh, <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. It went well last year. I mean, I think the interesting bit was, and this is always, okay, this is tricky stuff, right, for the old white bloke, okay, is the panel really also allowed people of all ages and interests expose the conversation on the panel. Now, you have to be careful you don't go, you've just invited the girl along, tick, okay, right, to join the panel. Yeah. You know, we're having a historical panel, and the guys have been, the guys, the old blokes on the, panel, on the committee, happy to have a new female member join the committee by everybody, okay, uh, working their socks off to try and get a female gaming historian on the <laughs> panel. Can't do yeah. it. But all the other panels, we want to do that, mix of ages, and we're trying to work really hard to produce that new audience and that new kind of visibility mm. for how it's done. So, um, you know, I think there's a whole debate about the increasing number of, you know, some of the best painters in the world are female, et cetera, aren't they? Okay, right? And all the prize winners and gamers. Again, I'm going to sound like a patronizing old git. I'm not trying not to be here. I'm trying to make the point that we are trying to yeah. get the widest possible diverse uh, uh, view into things. And we've got very shy and retiring Richard Lard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's coming on the panel, so you know. Yeah. He'll, talk, he'll talk about it. Yeah. He'll talk about no it. No controversy there at all. No, no. So the the, the talks, like I say, um, went down well. Little minor changes this year. Uh, do, you, do you see it's going to be a continuation thing? I think it's something that keeps people in the show, isn't it? Because they, a lot of shows that I've been to um, recently have really died off at like two o'clock. Um, whereas if you've got somebody you want to see talk at four o'clock, it's going to keep you in the show, keep you circulating, maybe spend a bit more time um, yeah. had in we, the area. Hadn't we thought that? I had to say, I hadn't thought that. We were just thinking about promoting wargaming, promoting different views of wargaming, do something different. Uh, I mean, it generally wasn't kind of you know a clever marketing ploy in that way. Good thought, though. Um, <laughs> what, what's your percentage for that idea? Um, you know, easy. I think actually, though, we, we are we're less of that curve than you think, mm. especially since we did switch to e tickets, which we keep open all day until like four o'clock. So you can get off the DLR, that's that's a train, okay? So can you wonder it's okay, right? Mm. It's a London train, okay? Is that the, Dur the DLR. Durham Light Infantry? That's it, not them, okay? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And as you're walking up the hall to the door, you can buy the ticket and your e-ticket phone appear will scan your phone five minutes later, right? Yeah. Which, of course, does give us the heebie-jeebies occasionally as the ticket sales <laughs> do yeah. that at the end of the game, you might imagine, <laughs> like they did last year. <laughs> Let's be clear about this. So it's a joy and a pleasure, but it means that people are also, the days where people should have a queue busted and get there early have gone. So mm. we still get a big pile up of people, and we have to have a we have to have a separate queuing hall, by the way. That's how people yeah, are yeah. next to it. To zigzag in, but we tend to, we got a slightly flatter profile, I think, the last few years, in my impression. Mm. Where mm. I think people, well, if I rock at 11 o'clock, there'll be no queue, I'll get in, I'll still get a bag, controversial statement, okay, mm. and a figure probably from the first four or five thousand people to the door, and I still get to see most of the show. So I think we're seeing a flattening out of people doing that a little bit. 
And therefore, that means the two o'clock dead zone is less likely, no matter what we do, is my impression. Mm. Yeah, uh, good. Um, have you ever, I don't think you have actually, but have you ever run competitions within the um, frame of salute? Not to my knowledge. So interestingly, because Mark wouldn't know this, no, we haven't, okay? We occasionally think, you know, tournaments, you know, like tournament games. Mm. Game to- yeah. So generally, we're packed with like game games and stuff. So we're not really, because obviously a, a, a tournament game will take a lot of table space, you know, a tournament will take what, you know, six or eight, five by six tables. That's quite a lot of space that, that lots of clubs want to use instead. You know, like I said, the clubs want to turn up, people want to investigate. So, and also, you know, you need something to run it. You know, we, we, our ability to run those individual bits inside are, are tricky. You have to get somebody to charge. So as it happens, uh, you know, we uh, we had a, a, a space open up and um, coincidentally, a Batman tournament guys approached us. Ooh. Sorry, he's probably news to me. And uh, live news to my chair, live news to my president. <laughs> some ways. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and we are, and they're going to, but that's they're definitely, they are organizing it. They will, they all come in and they'll organize their little tournament. Again, we told the rules are you might play a tournament game, but you've got to be able to let people talk. It's not really really fenced off. People have sort of wander past the tables, chatting to them. So there is a kind of a balance here. I think the kind of fenced off tournament area feels a bit cold to me. This yeah. is just my view and a bit not really what Sleep's about. Like I said, you want to wonder at the people start going, oh my God, that thing is amazing and all the rest of it. And oh, we don't have the resources. We don't have the people to manage it. Yeah, yeah manage it, exactly. So this is, people. so somebody mm-hmm. happened to come to me and said, I want to put on a tournament and I had the space. I went, fine, it's all yours. As long as you abide the following rules, I don't have to run you. It's great. And again, yeah. We are open to all suggestions from anybody, okay, right, of these kind of things. So, yeah. I think I think those um, kind of the older shows that are now no longer with us. I'm thinking specifically of Derby with the World Championships, yeah, and Sheffield with triples, which were kind of more based around the competition initially, and then grew more into a. a, a a demo game and trade show event was alongside and that then enabled them to spread over two days because the competition was there for two days so there was always people kicking around for those and i wasn't aware of um salute being involved in that before but i just wanted to check with you guys whether yeah. it yeah, was yeah. something Hobby demos is that something that you've done i'm you know you go to you go to these cooking shows and you have the the, the the actual lardies um making yeah. beans on toast and stuff like that yeah yeah we have we have i mean yeah. to be clear like all this stuff right i've said we think this is this is me this year remember we get voted every year the committee so i just like put that caveat on these conversations okay i'm not speaking to the next year so we have a better idea a different idea they might not be really doing it okay so i'd like to put that caveat on it i think yeah we do that so uh i can't think of talking about it. so one of our standard ones we've had for a couple of years now is mm. every metal mm. the guys at every metal who are yeah. basically you you can't you they're the guys with the whistles right they do the Ooh, speed right, yeah. painting you get a figure yeah. speed paint the figure they probably take the figure home with you right blow a whistle full all day last year he always we always he always killed himself he said because he was so busy all day packed out with people <laughs> turning up do the 20 minutes speed painting yeah. that kind of stuff we've got some um Sculptors we've had before, yeah. We? yeah. So, do I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm naming names because I'm thinking, I, I, yeah, please anyway, look at the website for it. There are other other versions of this available on the website, he says. Yeah. Like, paint all the minis, for example, Duncan and Co. and all that lot, doing a lot of kind of demonstration support. Um, who kind of people from SMN we've got kind of popular little demo spaces next to them. Mm. So, I mean, that's a few. Um, I can name off the top of my head. So, we've got people actually doing kind of live stuff, green stuff world who are. Uh, I'm going to say Portuguese. I Spanish. forgot the name. Spanish. Sorry, Spanish. 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 Uh, Coming, do some demo stuff. Um, oh, brilliant. Yeah, so there's, there's some little kind of what we tend to do is in the game zones, we also allow people to put in demonstration stuff. And, you know, this is our kit, as long as it's active, it's not just a demo, it's not just a table of stuff. They have to be showing how stuff's done. But I would encourage everyone who attends, all gamers, to engage with people putting on games because I'm forever going, mm. how'd you do that? How did, where, where, how did you make that? What's that like? What you, yeah. And that's how I've, my hobbies developed, how my interest is developed, by finding, asking those questions and getting really interesting answers. You know, that's, that's how you learn. That's how you improve or you advance your hobby. 
And also, I, I mentioned a newbie this year is a guy called Griffcon and the Gamers Lounge. I've never been before. And they're basically, it's kind of bring it, open your kit, play around with your kit, build your model, help you know, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of, it's the kind of chill out zone for the sleuth, open your pack kind of thing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I would, of course, we have lots of unofficial versions of that because all the tables we put out from the cafe area inside, you're amazing how many people got their board games half open. The number of half played board games in the middle of the show they bought five minutes ago are being played on our tape, which is great. I love it. Okay. That's in between the sandwiches. Okay. Is, uh, yeah. That's what's cool to see that. Or people opening their models and assembling their models in front of them. It's always quite entertaining. I like that. Yeah. Oh, you're going to lose that key piece. Yeah, exactly. It's there. We, do, we do not recommend it by the warlords. Okay. So, oh. yeah. Yeah, drop a random turret in a cup of coffee or yeah. something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> can we just mention? Can we just mention a couple of things we do? This is sounds. Yeah. It sounds like we do a lot for charity. We don't like to talk about a lot it. of work for charity. There's, there's, there's a. Also, I mentioned we're doing a bit of um, supporting various kind of charitable efforts. Last year, we gave a free stand to uh, a stand run for the Institute of Cancer Research by uh, Lucien Zen who sadly lost uh, Anna Marie a few years ago. And she's a bit of a painter and war gamer. And they decided to use their hobby to do it. And it's a kind of a bit of a jumble sale of amazing stuff. And there's people have found a few real finds in there as well. So it's worth a visit. <laughs> and then we're running kind of, like I said, uh, kind of, kind of three kind of vets related uh, situations. Uh, the association, the war, Veteran War Gamers Association, got a table put on there. And we've got uh, Therapy UK, we're a big charity for all sorts of th gaming therapy but, you know, uh, ex-military, but all sorts of people in schools, all that kind of stuff. And also Models for Heroes, a guy who put around modelling as a therapeutic method for ex-service people, emergency services, and so forth. So please pop by them and support them. Thank you. Yeah, no worries at all. No worries at all. They're the Hobbies for Heroes, guys. Um, and lasses come to the Fiasco show as well, so uh, very familiar with with them um and we support uh one of our local hospices who uh, one of our members passed away and and he left quite a lot of money to the club and and we support the the charity of the hospice that he was at um as a result of our show so yeah very very uh happy to hear that you mentioned earlier on the goodie bag the famous salute goodie bag uh how does that get put together and, and what tends to go in it so, so uh, obviously, so at some stage early in the year, we pick a uh, a theme for the game, and then a figure, and then though you mentioned this year, we've sort of moved to a more a more standard salute theme that we will bend slightly to fit it. Mm. So you may notice the pirate figure this year. last year was easy, fifty years, it's gold, right? And that was a great idea for a shield. And so the uh, brains trust this year have worked hard to sort of bend it into the piratey theme. And the idea is, again, people may change this later on, is to maintain that kind of brand image and bend it to whatever the theme is of the year, uh, the figure. Right. Um, and it tends to be based on the figure rather than us saying you almost run a sleep, almost run a Vietnam game because again, that's not how it works. Okay. Um, though people obviously there will definitely be a lot of pirate games around this year because we did the pirate theme and people will do it. So yeah, so we did the figure. The point is, and then the bag has that design in it. And we're very grateful to a couple of sponsors. We like to mention those, are we? Okay. Yeah, of course, we are, uh, yeah. Uh, so KR Wayland, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. You'll sponsor the bag. Um, and then we start stuffing the bag with stuff. So it gets a program. We normally get obviously the figure in there, uh, some dice from us, uh, and then we start seeing what else we can get. So people are keen to either you know put in flyers for advertising, which mm. you know we charge, but also a really generous and obviously it's a marketing mm. thing too. So you know. Uh, dice mats last year, it's some pretty big, chunky bits of scenery, uh, mm. rule books. Um, I what I have started doing is saying to people, tokens, you know, mm. you spend on the day, why not drop in? This is what we offer people, say, so as ideas, you know, rather than send you know 4,000 versions of your rule book or a thousand of your latest sprue, which is the kind of thing people do, okay. Um, and I'm not going to reveal what's in the bag yet because that's going to be a surprise for our PR marketing. Thank you. And my and Alex will kill me if I say it out loud now. <laughs> um, so no exclusives on that one just yet. But you know, so tokens. So there'll be you know, first four four or five thousand people will get a figure. Then we'll spread around the other love a bit. So if you haven't got a figure, you'll get something else. And then there'll be some random tokens in there which will be spend on the day at a stand. So that kind of mix. But I reckon. We've got besides our stuff, 
we've got 15 different things in there of various wow. everything from you know several hundred nice mice mats to access to lots of sprues of things in other places and again really generous and really grateful for people to do it he will get name checked properly on the facebook page shortly so that's how it happens uh, so is there some poor bugger who's got to go around the bags and put them all in there? Do you have a, well, do you, like, say, Monday night? The time, <laughs> to, to remember, we no, remember we set up on a Friday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I used to do it, stuff bags. Yeah. So we 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 start work at 7 a.m. on a Friday morning, okay? And that's when the first guys arrive start setting up. In the bad old days, there used to be six pallets of junk on the side and a big pile of bags. And there'd be twenty wardlords packing bags. Oh wow! Right, that used to be bad old days. Well, good old days, bad old days. It's very, very um, team forming, that's for sure. Mm, okay. Yeah. But well. what we do now, we we pay for packers. So right. to see that, that we we get away to send the stuff to professional pack, bag packers, you know, like party bag packers, and they do it for us. It arrives in a big box back in. Thank God. I was going to say that's going to be a relief, isn't it? Rather than. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. done by machines rather than people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So uh, yeah, it makes it just a bit easier. Well, especially with the amount of gear now we get into it, it's extraordinary. So, again, we're, people are very generous and it, obviously good for their businesses, but also as we'll umph the bags. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, so, we'll just um, come to it then um, promotion of the show. Um, obviously, appearing on podcasts is not a bad idea. Um, so, you mentioned earlier on that you, your younger members are kind of branching out onto social media and that sort of thing are you still doing the traditional place in ma ads in magazines and that sort of thing um, how have you yes, done about yeah. promoting yeah yeah we're still advertising in the magazines because i know there's certain you know certain of our readers not everyone's on facebook which we acknowledge and mm. realize so we've got adverts placed in magazines i mean any way we can reach that wargaming public then uh, that's what we do I, and part of the reason i go around the shows is i've got leaflets going have you heard a salute? Do you want to come? And it's amazing. There's still people who haven't, but um, yeah. you know, we go around and we just try and raise awareness, you know, of, of the show. I know last year, you know, I had a press pass with the Yorkshire Gamer, etc., and and did like a little report on it when I came back. Is is that important for you as well to get people in the hobby involved? But then, as well as that, have you tried to reach out to national press or London Evening Standard, those sorts of people? Mm, right. Yes. Our experience with the media and the press, uh, you know, there, there's an angle, isn't there? It's got to be a story. It's not. There were five thousand really happy war gamers turning up at Excel. That that isn't a story. They want an angle, and um, sometimes that angle isn't what we want to portray. So we're a bit nervous about that. Our run-ins mm. with them recent in the, the previous few years haven't been great. But right. um, it's more about you know reaching people in the war games group and going through the magazines but also how else can we get to them and we're always open to ideas and bloggers lots of people read blogs podcasts if we can get those people engaged and certainly when i go to war game shows i'm talking to a lot of those people and you know saying you know what did you think of salute getting feedback as well because you know look it's not perfect we want to find out how we can do things better and very often it's people we don't agree with everything they said but it's their perception you know of the show what can we do to make it better and so we're you know, we listen and we try to engage with the gamers all the time. So make it a better experience for everyone. Yeah. And looking up podcasts there, and as you know, the quality of the podcast is quite low that we let in. So, yeah, exactly. you know, all, all, exactly. So, so, you know, so, uh, Northern and sweary. Uh, <laughs> so, so but yeah, but, I mean, we're really keen. Like I said, we, we, we put aside a bit of a room, let podcasters just you know, sit down for five minutes and charge their gear if necessary and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, um, absolutely. And again, if you're a podcaster and you want to come around one on the show and take films, give us a shout and we'll see what we can do. Um, the more the merrier. Uh, that's what I said. I don't know whether there's anything that you can give away, but is there any sort of plans in the future for new things? Or, you know, a lot of people have done tie-ins with museums and stuff, for example, recently, the Lardies. Is there, is there anything in the future that you can reveal of new features or new ideas to promote? Uh, the answer is no, because seriously, <laughs> yeah. not, not because, not because, you know, a one shot at a time, everybody. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah no. Yeah. Secondly, like I said, we, we, we are an elected committee. Okay. People put themselves forward. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not pretending there's 10 people put forward every post. It's not like the American elections here, folks. You know, it tends to be, 
the usual suspects for a few years and suddenly goes, I've had enough, somebody else's turn, right? Yeah. But we are an active committee to run this club and the show. So another committee may change their mind on stuff and have a different ideas. I, I would say it seems likely that the stage idea and panels is going to run, is my suggestion. Um, I think uh, it's more the challenges we face. Let's not go too long. I, I mean, the whole industry, you know, let's not go down the 3D print conversation, but that's, that surely has to be a really interesting challenge for the, for the mm. industry and for the shows. And then I think, um, I mean, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. I think mm. our ambition is to, let's keep it up to date, but let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Is, um, just before we finish off, is there anything else that um, oh, you've got a list? Uh, is there anything else that we've not covered that uh, you'd like to cover? No, I think I think the nature of Salute is changing. It's evolving. We've become much more. Our goal is to be more inclusive. Um, but people have got to understand it is run by a group of amateurs. And a lot of people feel particularly gives up a lot of their time to make yeah. it work. And it's a tightrope. It really is, whether it's successful or not. And our biggest brief is we've inherited this show, this fantastic show. And we're very, very keen to keep it running, to build on that legacy. Um, but it's a challenge. As you said, you know, the, the world's changing with the internet and the way traders trade. And we've got to keep making it relevant. And that's what we're trying to do by making it more accessible, getting more kids to come through, more families to come, and finding a way they can enjoy it as a day. But it is, as Phil said, it's the South London Wars Club Night or Club Day, you know. Yeah. That's what it means. Really, it's become so this, this piece. <laughs> But essentially, it's the club's open day. Yeah, all that. I, I, just to reiterate, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Let's be clear about this, okay? Let's put it in the first place. This didn't come... I didn't invent this yesterday. Um, absolutely not. And also, I keep getting name-checked by him, but that's not fair because mm. there's four, five, six, seven people who are absolutely holding me up in this process too, okay? So let's be clear about this in the yeah, club. absolutely. Uh, like I said, Carl Chairman and uh, Peter and Alex and, uh, and, and John and... Uh, Tony and other people, I'll name check out loud just to embarrass them. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll just do a great job to make this work uh, you know, alongside their day jobs. And they are really committed. They really work incredibly hard. It's it's, it's quite uh, inspiring. Me, I just do my best job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just just kind of my bit at the end is um, I I know I'd like to encourage as many people as possible to go to as many shows as possible, not just your show, uh, Absolutely. and and, yeah. and and fiasco up in Leeds. Um, yeah. you, you know these things when they disappear, they tend not to come back. You know, you look at triples, you look at Derby; these shows have just disappeared. And there's something very tactile and very hands-on about our hobby that. You know, you can't get from the internet. You can't walk up to that table with loads of really nicely painted figures on, on or Lego Flash Gordon and go, wow. You just can't do that on the internet. You can see it as a picture, but you can't, it's not the same experience for me. So um, I always, you know, want to encourage people to keep, you know, keep these things alive and, and the hard work that you guys do, the hard work that the lads do at Leeds and, you know, the committee who organise it. I've been involved. I kind of know where you're coming from. So um, kudos to you guys for, for, for sorting this, this out for for everyone. Um, so that just that leaves me to um, give you a chance to plug the date, location and how people get tickets. Well, you can say that. Oh, apparently I'll do this. Uh, <laughs> so it's on the 30th of April in 2024. Yeah. Okay, I uh, need to write that down if I'm coming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have had people turn up early and late, so it does happen. Yeah, I can imagine. I'll I'll, I'll resend you the address for your sat nav as well, just in case. Okay, yeah. you know, just in case it's a long way south. Okay, so if you basically just Google Salute Fifty One, you will get to the website, and the website will have ticket links, the lists of traders, the games, the layout of the plan paint competition stuff, all the details. So if you basically just Google Salute 51 or South London Warlords, you'll get to our webpage and it's all on there. It's the easy way of doing it. Ditto, if you uh, search on Facebook Warlords or Salute, you'll get the same thing. And just so everyone knows then, do you need to buy your tickets beforehand online or you can, can you pay on the day? On the yes, day? please. If you all buy your tickets today, all 6,000 of you, oh, that'd be really great, please. Go, go now. <laughs> no. um, so, um, 
it's all e-tickets online. So basically, you buy a ticket, it's downloaded to your device, or you can't be but downloaded to your device, and we scan phones. There was a, we, we all know we had a bit of a glitch last year, Glass kind of had a problem, we, we've upped that. Things we learned, okay, new, new scanner provider. So um, yeah, buy your e-ticket online, it's downloaded to your device or your phone, most people, or you can print out the QR code, and we scan you to the door. We, we try, obviously, we are trying to be as cashless as possible in this modern age. If you really want to turn up and pay us cash, okay, it will be 20 quid on the door as opposed to 15 quid because the overheads just make it ever history of this. But, um, yeah, but like I said, you can buy a ticket as you approach the door and five minutes later have it scanned. So if you're not sure you're coming, obviously it's very important you buy a ticket now, but should you decide or not, you know, you can make a decision quite late in the day. Give me a heart attack and all you both don't buy a ticket until the day before is a good way to give me a heart attack. Okay. Exactly. Uh, can, I, can I just say for the members of the public listening out there, I am in my mid to late 50s. I live in Yorkshire and I can work an e-ticket. So none of this, oh, I don't do technology bollocks. I can do it. You can do it. Simple as that. Simple as that. And if you can't, get your kids to do it for you. <laughs> they'll, they'll probably buy some shit on the internet or something that you, they shouldn't do as well. But there we go. Um, so it's been lovely chatting with you guys. Um, and at the end of the show, I always ask, uh, give my guests an opportunity to ask me a question because um, I've been hounding you for three hours. Um, so, um, Martin, have you got one or do I, get a, do I get away with it? Well, I think you've said you've been to Salute last year or mm. you've been before. Um, any feedback you can give us? How do you think we could improve the show? More Yorkshire. <laughs> Uh, no, I have to say, I, I I really, really enjoyed it last last year. Um, and very much, as, for me, it was a social thing because, you know, I've been doing this for three, um, three years now. And um, there's a lot of people who live down south who I've not physically met before. Fraser Von Ketteringham, I met, met up with him. Dave, Br Dave Brown, um, I'd, I've met the Lardy guys a few times before. But there's lots of people. Giles Chapley, who was on the last episode, um, he collared me. <laughs> said oh can i come on the show um and then um lovely ian fraser who gave me a round dice in the middle of one of the uh, uh of the aisles at salute which is very very kind of him so yeah the you know for me i could see what you were doing with the talks and things and and bringing that different flavor in uh so i i very much enjoyed it and it wasn't as you know, when I've been to Salute in the past, I can't remember whether it was Kensington Town Hall or the or Olympia, I couldn't move. You know, it was so crowded and it had that nice busy, but not, I'm running out of oxygen here because there's so many people in the yeah, room. Well, that's, that's what we so, said about the barn. This is a trade-off between the barn and the coziness is really tricky. I get you, completely get you. Yeah. So that's the barn side. Uh, my question to you is, oh, by the way, I remember I remember seeing a cluster of podcasters, about eight of them having a conversation in the middle of the show. Once That's one thing I saw. Yeah. I thought, there's a car crash here. Half the wargaming population of podcasters will go in one go. You all in the same, <laughs> same, same spot. Yeah, we like, we're, like the royal, we're like the royal family. We can't go on yeah, the Yeah, yeah, shouldn't come together, eight of you. It's <laughs> terrible. My question to you is, my question is a gaming one. What on earth possessed you to do the 1700th ships? I'm massive. What, 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 where'd that come from? Do you know what? I, I, I People who listen to me and uh, um, see my blog and stuff know this. I just have these mad ideas that come from literally nowhere. And I've been a big naval war gamer all my life. Um, and I've got virtually every ship in World War II and 1-3000th. Massive World War One collection, which Jutland will be at salute this year, um, in 1-2400. So I kind of like, I need to do something different um, and I hadn't really, I hadn't really made any models since I was a kid. Other, you know, you can't really, you can't really count um, like a Warlord game Sherman tank with a a hull, a turret, a barrel, and two tracks. That's not a model kit. Um, so I just picked a mod. Um, um, I was up in Ho um, Edinburgh on holiday, and I went to a place called uh, Wonderland Models, which is the best model shop in the world, and it's amazing. And I couldn't find anything to buy. So I bought a model of Tirpitz, one seven hundred scale, and then, and then the, the way that my mind works, then thought, well, if I shave the bottom off it, 
and do it because it wasn't a waterline bottle. I've not even thought yeah. that far. So I was hacksawing the bottom of the Bismarck off. Uh, but so that's where it came from. And then I thought, okay. um, as I always do, I then go, what can I do with these? <laughs> yeah. So it's always the way. It's always the way. Well, thank you very much again, gentlemen. Um, just leaves us to say good night to the audience. Good night. Good night. Uh, good night, uh, Phil and Martin, and um, hopefully everyone can make it down to uh, salute and, and say hello to the guys there and come and see me at the Jutland table, um, which is the biggest thing in the show by a long way. <laughs> 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 see you later, guys. See you. Bye. And just like that, Another episode is over. Hope you enjoyed that chat about Salute. And uh, hopefully, I went a bit Jerry Springer at the end, didn't I, with me, uh, like, thought for the day. But please, if you can, support your local war game shows. Uh, they're only there because we go to them. And, uh, you know, we put games on, we put participation games on, and we use our time uh, and effort to promote the hobby and uh, try and get more people involved in what for many of us who are listening has been a lifetime dedication. Unfortunately, I am unable once again to announce my next guest at this point in the show like I normally do. Um, I, it's been a, it's been a right chew on uh, getting things sorted recently. Um, so uh, I have got guests lined up. It's just getting people tied down to recording dates, etc. Uh, so I will be back possibly by the end of the month, if not the start of March, uh, with another guest. And until then, you can always go back and listen to the old episodes, which are all available on Podbean and all the other podcast uh, hosts out there, Apple, uh, Google, everywhere it's it's available. And if you do get a chance, please leave a like and review and follow us or subscribe to us. Uh, wherever you see it. It just uh, increases the profile of the podcaster and brings more people in and gets us higher up that uh, league table that comes out every week. So once again, thanks for listening. Hope you have a great war game in time until I see you or uh, speak to you next. Until then, see you.